I believe the phone number is trustee or. Oh, okay, great. Trustee or can you, can you confirm that? And Linda, if that uh, if that's true, are you able to change the screen name? Yes, once she confirms. Okay. Uh, I'll shoot her an email or text. No, oh, thank you. It is trustee or, but she cannot hear. She can hear us, we cannot hear her. Oh, okay. Let's see. Prabhu, can you hear me? Verda? Yeah. Yes, I just want to let you know, I presented the actual evaluation to the city council on Tuesday. And I promised them that you were gonna be returning over 15% a year for the next three years. I don't know if he can do that, but just, you know, I just want to let you know what I told him. Only 15? Yeah, you know what? I thought about 20, but I thought that would maybe be too much. So I just dropped it off to 15. Because that's not too much. I think the recording has not started. So yeah, we can say whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hi, hi Jerry. Have, uh... oh, good morning. How are you? Oh, good, morning. good morning. All right. So we have uh, Trustee yeah, Horowitz, so Trustee Chandra, Trustee Jennings, Trustee Orr. So it's just, is it, um, is Trustee Kelleher with us? I don't believe he's in the meeting yet. It's um, 5.833. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have a long agenda today. So good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for um, coming today. I am going to call the order, the meeting to order. So um, at 8.33, call to order the meeting of the Federated City Employees Retirement System and Federated City Employees Healthcare Trust, Thursday, August, eight, uh, March 18, 2021. Let's start with roll call. Uh, Vice Chair Horowitz. Present. Thank you. Trustee Chandra. Present. Thank you. Trustee Jennings. Present. Thank you. Trustee Kelleher. Uh, and Trustee Orr. So with Trustee Orr, um, how, how do we best handle that vote? Um, Harvey, I don't know if you heard earlier that um, Trustee Orr is online, but we are not able to hear her. Um, is there, she, she, she can hear us, but we can't hear her. Uh, I think we're going to have to treat her as not present uh, for that reason. If she's not able, to, if we can't see a vote, if she's not able to vote, then she's not able and participate in the deliberations. Um, can she call in to the phone line? Well, she can call. She in. is on the phone. She if, is on the phone. If she could indicate her vote, that would be fine. If How about could, in the chat? There. Oh no, there would be a chat. Or she There's, can. She can text me, or I, is it star six to unmute? I, I don't know. Yes, I don't uh, know. Trustee Orr, can we try the star six? Mm -hmm. I believe Trustee Orr may be driving. Oh. So is that right, uh, Linda? Yes, she is. So it may be hard for her to, unless you, she actually make a stop, it may be hard okay. for her to, uh, deal with her 
she okay. just uh, she just texted me uh, um jay that she can actually text me her vote when we are voting rb is that acceptable yeah. uh if you if you recite it uh, orally uh, i think that's fine hello okay. this is Elaine. Oh, can you hear yes. me Yes, oh. yes, we can. Oh. Never mind. Thank you. Zoom had me muted, but Linda gave me the magic, uh, <laughs> the magic password. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Okay. Great, great. We now thank have you. trustee right. or president. Sorry, everyone. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, thank you and good morning. All right. Uh, so we have five members with us today. So today we start with closed session. And um, we anticipate, uh, as posted on the agenda, and we anticipate closed session to be about 30 minutes. So let's go into closed session now, and we'll see any, everyone a little after nine o'clock. And um, FYI, because of, uh, as my understanding, it's changes with Zoom, uh, staff is no longer able to put trustees into the, um, um, into the uh, uh, closed session room in advance. So please uh, be patient as they move us in one by one. All right.
Counting one, two, three, four, five. Oh. Um, is Trustee Orr back with us? I don't see her uh, number. Linda, do you see uh, Trustee Orr? No, I do not. Okay. She may have hit another button while she's driving here. All right, well, let's, let's go and return to um, open session. There were no, no reportable actions out of closed session. Um, as we start open session, let me start by um, announcing the ground rules again. All votes will be roll call votes. If you're not speaking, please be on mute to cut background noise. For discussion items, each trustee will have a turn to speak in roll call order more than once if desired. The public will have an opportunity to speak on each item after the trustees. The public will also have an opportunity to speak again at the end of the meeting on any other item not on the agenda that is within the subject juris just, excuse me, jurisdiction of the board. All right, um, next uh, orders of the day. Thank you for putting those up. Um, so under orders of the day, we're we need to pull item 1.1L uh, from the agenda, the, uh, that application for retirement uh, for Mr. Daniel R. Kelly uh, has been withdrawn. Um, we have a long agenda and it may be, may be uh, relevant. There will be a recess from, uh, from one to 105, um, as most of you know, to accommodate the Civic Center TV's broadcasting schedule. And then, um, I'm looking at a good time to take a break and you know, I'm somewhere around the 10 or 10.30 ish and um, I'm eyeballing it uh, somewhere around 3F. Uh, that would be the last um, Makita presentation. But let's see how that goes. Um, but I do wanna be mindful of, of um, giving give everyone a chance to recharge and uh, uh, maximize our productivity here. All right. 
uh, for that, I uh, need a motion and a second to accept orders of the day. So moved. I make all second. Vice Chair Horowitz and a second by Trustee Chandra. Any discussion? Okay, um, roll call Jay, vote. Just one thing really fast. <clears throat> yes. I need to leave about one o'clock or so. I have something I have to do. So um, I can transfer over to my phone, kind of like how uh, Trustee Orr was doing, um, but there are certain okay. zones okay. of. Yeah, we, we may we may be done by then. We may, okay. we may not, Just, but we may be done. I'm, okay. Hopefully, it doesn't make a problem. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. So, um, roll call vote. Um, Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Kelleher. Still not here. And then Trustee Orr. Aye. Great, thank you very much. So that motion carries. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I also vote aye. That motion carries five to zero. All right. Uh, next is item one, the consent calendar. For today's consent calendar, we have approval of service retirements. Uh, the uh, usually large March list. Thank you staff for processing all of these. <clears throat> We have approval of deferred vested, approval of board minutes, approval of return of contributions, acceptance of communication information reports, <clears throat> and approval of travel conference attendance. Right. Do we have a motion and a second to accept the uh, consent calendar? Or, is there, or are there any request, requests to pull anything off? Okay, I'll make a motion to, to approve. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, Trustee Chandra makes the motion. Trustee Jennings makes a second. Any other yeah. discussion? Roll call. Public discussion? All right, roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Horowitz? Aye. Thank you. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Thank you. Trustee Jennings? Aye. Okay, Trustee Kelleher and Trustee Orr. Aye. Great, thank you. I also vote aye. That motion carries um, also five to zero. Moving on, item two, death and survivorship notifications. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for those who served the city and the recent in the past. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're moving on to item three, investments. 3A is the oral update from the CIO Retirement Services, Mr. Prabhu Palani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we do have somewhat of a long investment uh, session today. So thank you for your patience, everyone in advance. Um, so we will have uh, Newberger and Makita um, actually talk about our quarterly performance in the case of private markets third quarter. And in the case of uh, public markets in the overall plan fourth quarter. We will also talk about strategic asset allocation. Um, we had a discussion uh, regarding this at the last IC, and now we present it to the full board. And we also have an item on the city's pre-funding option. Uh, but before we get to all those items, um, I just wanted to share some performance numbers with the board uh, and just Please bear in mind that these are not official audited numbers. But for last month, the month of February, uh, the plan returned 1.19%. Uh, and March, uh, through March 16th, uh, it was 1.59%. Fiscal year to date, the plans returned 20.54%. <clears throat> of course, we still have a full quarter and two weeks left uh, for the fiscal year to end and anything can happen in the markets. But at this point, <clears throat> barring Mr. anything- Pani, could you repeat that last number, the fiscal year to date? Sure, it was 20.54. Thank you. And I was just saying that barring anything catastrophic, hopefully you know, um, we will beat our assumed rate of return of six and five eighths for this fiscal year. 
And <clears throat> the one-year trailing number uh, is actually less relevant, um, but I just want to mention it because it gives me a great kick to talk about it. Uh, so the one-year trailing number is 33.87%. And um, I'll never get to share this number, um, probably not for the rest of my career. So I just want to mention this. And it just goes to show how, how important start and end dates are. So the one-year trailing number obviously takes into account the fact that between April and June of last year, the market just took off. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to turn this over. Uh, unless anybody has any questions, I'd like to turn this over to Casey Boyer of New Thank you, Mr. Polani. Welcome, Ms. Boyer. Welcome back. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, always happy to be here. It's nice to give quarterly updates um, as opposed to seeing you all just uh, annually. So um, happy to be here. Um, I have good news and we should continue to have good news um, hopefully moving forward. I'm going to be presenting the Q3 2020 uh, numbers. However, we have started receiving Q4 information. Um, it's the middle of March, but typically year-end reporting takes a little bit longer. So we typically aren't actually releasing uh, financial statements until the end of April. So just to give you a sense of timing in terms of how long it actually takes to get in performance. Um, but we have started receiving some Q4 information in um, so I'll, I'll kind of preview that here as well. Um, starting on page two, which is the first summary page, um, this is just a, a good outlook of the total program. The first column being uh, legacy, which are the investments, um, private equity investments that were made prior to starting the tr strategic partnership. Um, with Newberger, and then of course you'll see the combined information. Um, so far, we have committed just over 250 million starting in May of 2017. So we now have um, three, three and a half years of investing um, under our belt. Um, capital has been going into the ground. And I think just kind of at the end of last year, we've now started seeing some real development in realizations. And I think um, now we can expect moving forward that we um, will have some more distributions and realizations within the portfolio. As you know, it always takes a few years, not just to invest to the capital, but then for those investments to mature and become ready to um, be realized. So overall, um, uh, good returns, good early strong returns so far at the bottom, you'll see for the strategic partnership a 1.2 times um, net multiple um, and a 17.4% uh, net IRR that compares to last quarter. Um, of a 12.17% IRR. So a nice uptick there. Overall, Q3 was up a little over 10%. Um, we have probably about 60% of Q4 um, financial statements from the underlying investments in and from our calculations. Obviously, this is not final it looks like Q4 will again be up over 10%. It might even be closer to 13 or 14%. So um, definitely, as has been mentioned many times before, 2020, um, very volatile year, um, both in terms of uh, you know, some company performance, but overall, um, the whole year has been up and very unexpected from what, from where we were a year ago today and, and what we probably would have expected at that point in time. I'll move on to page three. So the next, the next um, three pages actually are 
benchmarking the performance of the underlying investments, of the underlying fund investments. So on page three, you'll see the legacy investments that were made into your portfolio prior to the new Newberger Strategic Partnership. Um, you'll see what their performance is on a gross basis. Um, this is actually a net basis as well um, for you all. So these are the, the real performance here that you're looking at. Um, and then it's quartiled against its peers within the marketplace. Um, so you'll see a lot of these investments were made in uh, vintage years, you know, 2006, 2008. So those performance metrics are not moving around anymore. Um, those are pretty much set. So I would say for the most part, this portfolio um, outside of the 2018 investments, this is likely where the performance will end up. Page four and five show the same analysis benchmark um, of the fund investments within the Newberger Strategic Partnership. Um, the, for the most part, first and second quartile, you'll notice, of course, uh, that pesky investment 47, which is still um, only has one investment um, and it's still held at cost. So what you're seeing there is a J-curve effect where the fund has um, uh, been calling for expenses and, and fees, but um, unfortunately, the portfolio hasn't been written up just yet. So you're seeing that underperformance um, leading to that fourth quartile. It is a strong manager that we do have a lot of confidence in. So we, we believe this will turn around and, and they simply need to get more capital into the ground. Um, but hopefully that in the next few quarters, will um, uh, you'll see a difference there. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll turn to page six. Page six, um, we want to show this to really highlight and, and give you some more information about where the exposures are within the portfolio, both in terms of the investment type and geography. So on the top, the top three pie charts, you'll see by investment type. So primary fund investments um, are, you know, simply making an investment into a fund, a co-investment making a, an investment into a direct portfolio company. So um, directly into a company and a secondary is simply buying a, a, uh, a fund investment on the secondary market, um, you, uh, typically for a discount. Um, so you'll see here uh, the first two pie charts. Um, the first one is on committed. So we have committed approximately 75% of the capital into primary funds. Um, and then you'll see the remaining into co-investments and secondaries. However, if you move to the next pie chart, invested capital, um, this shows the capital that has actually been um, invested into those companies or into those funds. So it does exactly what we want it to do. Um, Co-investments and secondaries are able to get capital into the ground much more efficiently. That capital is called immediately and invested immediately into those companies. So over time, you'll see these pie charts um, be very much closer to the same numbers as the primary funds invest more capital over time. And then on, on the right, you will see the Newberger and the legacy investments combined. On the bottom, you'll see the same analysis for geography. Um, I would say our very typical geographic breakout is similar to what you'll see in that committed pie chart. Um, we do still tend to invest very heavily in North America, um, the most mature market um, with what we've seen as um, the, you know, the market that has the most experience, experienced GPs and firms. Um, so we still continue to do that while having a, a, you know, a very good exposure to Europe um, and Asia. 
page seven, um, a little bit more analysis on the overall performance of the fund. So not on the underlying investments, but on the actual uh, strategic partnership. So you'll see at the top, the performance breakout for investment type. So primary, secondaries, and co-investments. Um, again, exactly what we would expect. Um, the secondaries tend to come in um, given you've bought them at a discount, they tend to have a, a quick uh, return to the portfolio. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually think the primaries here is probably the most exciting part um, to have a portfolio as young as yours to already be held at a 1.2 um, for primaries is, is um, very much moving in the right direction. So, um, I think that's a, a, a big positive within the portfolio this early on. And then at the bottom, you'll see the overall fund. So the strategic partnership with Newberger, you'll see the performance from Q3 and Q2, and you'll see how it's benchmarked against Q2 performance. So unfortunately, <laughs> the benchmark here, which is um, Cambridge, their benchmarks come out quite late. So they don't have Q3 available just yet. Um, so we are benchmarking our Q2 performance, which is the 12.17% net IRR against um, their quartiling metrics there. So um, positive, obviously we're always aiming to get uh, first, qu first quartile and first quartile, which I think we'll, um, we will obtain. Um, but uh, this is what it is today as of Q2. And I won't go over in any detail pages eight and nine. This is as much detail as you could want on each of the underlying investments, both fund investments, as well as co-investments and secondaries. Um, so you can see how each one is performing. Um, and on the very bottom of page nine, you'll kind of see those totals of legacy and, and new burger. Um, as well as total. So I will stop there um, if you all have any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Questions, reactions from uh, board members? Quick question here, this is Trustee Horowitz, more operational. Mm -hmm. I recall in the past year, the the board sitting as a committee of the whole, uh, reviewing just one co-investment um, that we made. And I see that we have uh, 27 co-investments. Uh, do these co-investments exist uh, from before my time on the board or is the board only reviewing certain co-investments uh, to make a decision that is the board as a whole? Sure, I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, so the co-investments that, that we take to the full board are those that occur outside of our Newberger Berman Strategic Partnership. So things that apply to venture capital, private debt, private real estate, or private real assets, all of those sit outside the Newberger program and go to the board or work under the delegated authority of the board. This structure that we have in place um, Newberger Berman actually has discretion over what goes in that portfolio. They presented uh, from the time that they competed for the, for the business uh, and several times thereafter about the structure of the program they put together. So um, none of the investments within this program need to go to the board, though the board does approve uh, future commitments to the program each year in conjunction with the pacing plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other um, questions, comments? Okay, Ms. Boyer, thank you very much for joining us again. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks it very much. Me. Yes, of course. Um, Mr. Polani, uh, would you like to introduce uh, 3C or should we just jump right over? Sure. Is, uh, I see Laura's here. Good Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. See, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we can go right into 3C, D, and E, 
which will be handled by Makita with sufficient time for discussion and Q&A after each, each of the items. Very good. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. This is Laura from Makita. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Great. Um, so to follow up on Newberger's presentation, we have a private markets report for the full program. It includes Newberger's information as well as your other programs in private debt, real estate, and real assets. Um, if you recall, this is, as uh, your CIO noted, lag one quarter. Um, so it's for the third quarter of 2020, and it's the public version of the report that has a bit less um, detail um, from uh, information that partnerships wish to keep private. Um, but your staff receives more information, obviously. Um, starting on page two, you can see the snapshot um, by account. Um, we have at the top the legacy private equity, which uh, began in 2005, Neuger Neuberger Berman, uh, which began in 2017, and then the private debt real estate and real assets program. And you can see if you look on the far right, um, you can see the internal rate of return or dollar weighted return of each of those programs. And you can see that performance has been uh, pretty strong um, relative to a public markets equivalent, which is a far right column. So on the far right is if you had invested these dollars um, at the same times um, into um, a public markets benchmark instead. Um, the um, private debt program is an exception in terms of performance. Um, if you recall, there are three large investments that were not originally in a private debt program, but were invested on an opportunistic basis um, by um, prior staff. Um, and those are sort of um, still dominating some of those returns. Um, if we take a look at real assets, um, this is an area that has been challenged recently. Um, uh, sorry, just the bottom line here. Um, you can see that the public markets equivalent return, if you had invested in real assets, would have been negative. Your program has been positive, and we expect that to build over time as that's a fairly young program. Taking a look at the next slide, we start out with private debt. Um, you can see here that um, there have been 11 investments um, that um, 240 million has been committed and over that has been contributed. Um, some of these partnerships were able to recycle capital. So this is a mature program. Um, it currently has a weight of three and a half percent of your overall assets relative to a 3% policy target. Um, we have a pacing plan that should bring it back um, closer to that, that lower weight over time. Taking a look at the next slide, you can see um, the contribution and distribution um, posture recently. Um, the second quarter of 2020 had um, a number of capital calls, as you might expect when there are more opportunities for investment in the market. Um, you can see the largest contributions and distributions at the bottom. Um, taking a look, I'll skip ahead to um, fund performance by Vintage and Strategy on page six. So here you can see the three funds that dominated um, the return still um, back from 2010 because these were very large commitments. And you can see starting in 2016 and 2017, your current staff has been making regular investments in accordance with the pacing plan. And some of those returns are quite strong. If you take a look, for example, at Aeromark separate account um, with a return an IRR of 12.9, um, Arbor Lane 2 um, up uh, with an IRR of 26.2 and Crestline co-investments at 13.5. Um, Octagon CLO is still a regular, uh, a relatively young fund uh, just having invested in 2018. So relatively strong recent returns um, for investments made under your current staff. Uh, we also have some additional information on the next slide um, in terms of the, the market value by geographic focus. And um, you can see here that North America similar to the Neuberger um, presentation, um, dominates the exposure. The next program starts on page eight and is the Real Assets Program. There have been seven investments. The Real Assets Program is still quite young, immature. Um, it equates to 1.2% of total retirement system assets relative to a 3% policy target. Um, you can see here that there were commitments made in 2016, 2017, 2019, and thus far in 2020 as well. And on page nine, you can see that um, there was a good amount of capital called in the third quarter of 2020, and that equates with these young funds making new investments. There were two commitments this quarter. You can see on the top of the slide, um, Orion Mine Finance Fund 3 and an energy co-investment. Um, I'll skip ahead to slide 11 to 
to look at the individual funds. You can see here that these are um, young funds in general and the performance is generally not yet meaningful. Um, the slide 12 shows you the percent of exposure by vintage year and also um, uh, by geography. The real estate program starts on page 13. Um, right now, um, there are real estate investments making up 3.3% of the retirement system's total assets relative to the 3% policy target, so quite close. Um, there have been 14 investments, um, and um, you can see here that the majority were made in 2017, but um, the staff has been regularly making investments since then as well. Um, on page 14, you can see that there were no new investments during the quarter that we're talking about. Um, but you can see here that there are regular contributions being called um, into the fund. Page 16 has each individual fund and its um, vintage year um, commitment um, IRR and peer IRR. You can see here that um, some of the DRA funds that you've committed to regularly over time have done quite well. Um, there are a couple negative returns here for um, 2017 funds. Um, and I would just point out that these in the, in the world of private markets are still quite young. Um, overall, the, um, the IRR is quite um, right on the nose of the peer IRR over the long period of time. And then on page 17, you can see the percentage of market value again by vintage year and exposure. Um, the um, exposure again, largely being concentrated in North America. Then we have a variety of slides on um, the market environment, which I'm, I'm happy to to take any questions on, but um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Questions, comments by uh, trustees? Okay, very good. Shall we move on to five, uh, 3D? Sure, yes. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Jared Pratt, to talk briefly about the total program, uh, total fund performance. Thank you. Laura and hi, everybody. Good morning. Page uh, four to cover some brief uh, market comments here. So just to provide some, some background, on this same page for the third quarter, which was a very strong quarter, none of the line items had a double-digit return versus here you can see multiple equity markets had double-digit returns as did commodities. Um, so as strong of a market as the third quarter was, the fourth quarter uh, was certainly much more so. Um, and that's basically on the back of, um, you know, economies opening back up with positive vaccine news and also some election clarity. Uh, on the bottom, I'd also point out that the Barclays Ag had a similarly um, kind of muted return for the third quarter. And then, you know, the 0.7% you see here for the fourth quarter and for 2021, with rates going up, Barclays aggregate is actually negative year to date. So um, I think it's interesting to think about the market environment um, for the plan's fiscal year from July 1st to today. You've basically seen the Russell 3000 uh, provide 35% returns versus the Barclays aggregate is actually slightly negative and close to about a negative 1% return. So a, a huge difference uh, since the plan's fiscal year start. Um, on page five, there's been a couple of interesting dynamics that have played out um, that are highlighted on this page. Um, one is, as we've talked about before, growth versus value. So you see Russell 1000 growth versus Russell 1000 value here um, for the one year period, a 35% difference uh, between the two, which is about as much difference as we've ever seen. Um, it's also interesting in international markets, if you look here at the bottom, um, in emerging market space, both in local currency as well as in U.S. dollars, which is the 18.3% the return, very strong returns, largely driven by uh, returns in China. Um, and then contrast that with what developed markets did. If you look at the EFA local currency line here, it's basically zero. Um, and the EFA return in dollars of 7.8 is just all currency movement as those currencies appreciated against the dollar. Uh, but a big difference between emerging markets and developed markets. Um, and finally, point out the Russell 3000 over 10 years has generated the 13.8% return of full thousand basis points per year um, over the Barclays aggregate down here at 3.8. Um, so just, just some interesting um, things that have played out in markets. Let me skip ahead now to your plans summary. 
So starting on page 24, uh, you see 2.7 billion in assets at the end of the year. Uh, that's roughly 445 million higher than a year ago. Um, and almost all of that obviously driven by investment returns. Um, everything is close to a policy target here as well. And then going to the next page, we can review some extremely impressive uh, performance returns here. So for the quarter, 10% um, return in a single quarter uh, in line with benchmarks. Um, so very nice to see that. For the fiscal year, you see a 17% return at the end of, of the year. And for one year, you see a 16% return well ahead of the benchmarks that we're showing and in the fifth percentile of the peer group. Um, so the peer group is public pension plans with over a billion in assets. There's roughly 80 plans there. Um, so obviously fifth percentile is extremely good. Um, moving on to a, uh, a couple of manager notes here. Um, and as you look through, you see that the one year return um, in any individual asset grouping is, uh, looks pretty good against whatever benchmark it's being compared to. Um, so I mentioned that growth had outperformed value by quite a bit for the year, but for the fourth quarter in particular, that was actually the reverse and value did quite well. And on the bottom of this page, you can see that artists and global value took advantage of that uh, with a 22% return in a single quarter, good for top quintile results. Um, a couple other managers I'll highlight on the top of page 31. Um, Overwise International Opportunities, a one-year return of 65%, um, outperforming their benchmark by 40% on the back of some strong stock selection. And on the next page, I point out RWC Emerging Markets with a 35% return just for the quarter, uh, nearly doubling its benchmark. Uh, and I also point out the Emerging Markets um, kind of basket has five different allocations there. So it's, it's a nice diversification and allows uh, to pursue some managers who can deviate from the benchmark like this uh, while still providing diversification as a whole. So with that, I will skip ahead to page 51. It's not gonna let me do it that way, one second. <laughs> okay, so this is one year returns for the plan. Um, so on the, on the far left, you can see the same return we talked about before of 16% for the past year, good for the fifth percentile rank. Um, but also, if you look at the second column, it's standard deviation, and you see a 42nd percentile rank here. Um, so actually, a little bit better than the peer group median on standard deviation as well. And so when you put the two together, you get the risk-adjusted return in the third column, um, which is the sharp ratio. So it's third percentile rank, uh, very near the absolute top of the pack um, as far as risk-adjusted returns for the one-year period. And then I'll finally comment on page 56. Uh, so this is return and percentile ranks over multiple periods. And I just wanted to point out that besides uh, beating 95% of peers for the one year period, the plan is beating 70% of peers uh, with this 30th percentile rank over three years. Um, so excellent results. And I'll, I'll wrap up comments there and see if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Pratt. Appreciate that. Any questions, comments from trustees? Seeing, hearing none, let's move then to 3E, presentation of calendar fourth quarter 2020 performance report for the healthcare trust. Sure, thank you. And I'll go through this quickly um, as well. So you see assets here of 354 million in the healthcare trust year. Uh, that was up about 40 million from a year ago. And almost all of that is from investment returns. Um, allocations close to target um, in this plan as well. So we're looking at returns. So, um, you know, near the policy benchmark for three years and in percentile ranks, 50th percentile or better uh, for all periods that we're showing. So that's top half of the peer group and uh, top decile returns in the peer group for the nearer term periods. Um, as far as manager um, comments, I'll skip ahead here to page 28. Uh, just to point out that a couple of the real estate funds, BlackRock and Clarion Lion, have done really well over the past year. Um, and it's also nice to see on the bottom that despite commodities kind of longer term performance, recently it's had very strong uh, results. So 22% return in the six month period reflected in fiscal year to date. And then finally, I'll move to page 36. 
just to note here, this is just a graphical representation of the percentile ranks I previously mentioned. Um, so yeah, so very strong results and happy to take any questions on the healthcare trust. Thank you again. Thank you again. Are there questions, comments from trustees? All right. Hearing none again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pat. Our, this will go on to 3F, discussion and action on the strategic asset allocation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I hand this over to Laura, uh, so strategic asset allocation is a very important discussion. It's one that we have annually. Um, and the reason for this is our consultant, Makita, comes up with revised capital market assumptions every year. And so we do a refresh to make sure that our SAA is in line with our expectations. Now, what does strategic mean? Uh, nobody really knows. Uh, the textbooks say that strategic is long-term and tactical is short-term, uh, but there's no real definition of what long-term is. Uh, but one would think that strategic should be three to five years and anything you know, shorter than that uh, should be tactical. Uh, but those definitions are pretty flexible. For example, we did make some big changes last year in our strategic asset allocation based on market movements. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if the markets are sort of trending along nicely without a great deal of volatility, uh, one would expect to hold on to one's SAA and give it some time to work uh, because it's important to keep in mind uh, that uh, these allocations are based uh, made based on 10 and 20 year numbers, uh, return expectations. It's very hard to get uh, from any source uh, short term return expectations. And uh, your IC uh, did actually recommend one of the options. And Laura will talk about this as she goes through the exercise of SAA. Uh, there are really three things that we're looking for the board's guidance uh, this morning. One is the strategic asset allocation for the plan. The second is strategic asset allocation for our healthcare trust, uh, which we have not visited in some time. And the third is uh, the investment benchmarks that we use for our strategic asset allocation. Uh, staff has recommended a couple of changes and we would like to discuss that as well. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn this over to Laura. Great, thank you. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'd actually like to start on slide three. Um, just to draw your attention back to your investment policy statement and, um, and what it says about asset allocation. Um, just as a reminder, and you know, as your CIO just noted, um, strategic asset allocation is a really important um, uh, role of the board um, to determine that. Um, your investment policy statement um, notes that it is the critical um, piece of the long-term success of the investment program and the single biggest determinant of the expected risk and return of the system. Um, we um, believe that um, your managers um, are very well selected and your staff is very skilled at manager selection. But that said, um, usually the dispersion between a couple of managers in a specific asset class is less than the dispersion over long periods of time between different asset classes. So selecting your uh, asset class makeup is very important. And the investment policy statement also includes the process um, that the asset allocation will be reevaluated annually. Um, and that it should be established and modified um, uh, based on a formal asset allocation study approximately every three years. So as you know, the last time that an asset allocation was adopted was um, just about a year ago. In fact, I think um, the 18th of March might've been a day that we had a, a special investment committee meeting. So it's uh, very close to exactly a year ago. And that was a result of what this slide says as well, that um, uh, the capital market assumptions um, and the asset allocation should be reviewed um, when the S&P 500 experiences a decrease of more than 20% from peak. So that is what drove the last um, asset allocation review. And the current asset allocation, as we just discussed with uh, performance, has served you quite well. Um, so we estimate, um, based on our updated capital market assumptions, that the um, expected return of the current asset allocation remains above your actuarial assumed rate of return of 6%. At 0.625% or 6.58. Um, one thing that has changed is that the, um, the expected standard deviation, which is calculated by Verus, has risen above the 12% that is currently stated in the investment policy statement. 
um, that was put in place a few years ago and market environments do change. Um, I know that everyone that's spoken to you today, um, including on private markets and, and everything has talked about the increased volatility in the market and that's reflected by a, um, a higher standard deviation. Um, so in this um, presentation, we go through um, some information about asset allocation um, and compare your current allocation to some other alternatives um, and, and do um, some analysis on those. So actually, if we wanna go back to page four, um, this slide could be titled that um, your job is harder than it used to be. Um, it used to be very easy to get your um, 6.625 um, expected return. You can see here that you could have invested 100% in bonds up until the year 2000 and earned that return um, or could have um, uh, included a lot less risk in your portfolio in recent years, but um, it is more difficult than it used to be to get to um, a pension fund like assumed rate of return. Um, this analysis on the next slide, I'll just remind you, is based on mean variance optimization. A mean variance optimization um, requires uh, a consultant or you know other service provider to set um, an expected return, expected volatility, and correlation to other asset classes for every individual asset class. Makita has been working on this process for 40 years. We know that none, none of the numbers are ever going to be exactly right, um, but uh, we we take an academic approach. Makita doesn't manage any assets, so we have no interest in inflating or deflating any particular asset class return or risk number. Um, there are some drawbacks to mean variance optimization that we've discussed in the past. Um, it assumes a normal return distribution um, and that volatility is stable over time, whereas we know that if yesterday was a really volatile today, day in the market, today is more likely to be volatile. Um, and, um, and so those are you know, a couple of things that, that just are necessary evils of mean variance optimization, but it's still sort of the gold standard for what everyone starts out with. Um, and then we layer on some additional types of analysis like historical scenario analysis and stress testing. Um, on the next slide here, you can just see how the um, efficient frontier has shifted downward. And now um, each asset class here has um, the uh, a higher standard deviation than it used to and lower return. And you can see here that um, we have added at one of your trustees request um, a, a black dot for the San Jose Federated um, Retirement System, which um, looks um, you know, very reasonable from a risk return perspective in this broad universe. On slide seven, you can see a variety of um, asset allocation mixes compared to your current. So on the, on the left column, um, we, um, we show your current asset allocation. You can see in the top row here, um, we've added the split between growth and then income and diversification. It's not a true equity bond split, um, like you hear 60-40, um, because you have many asset classes. Some are more um, focused on growth and some are more focused on, on protecting assets and diversifying assets for different market environments. And as you know, um, you use a functional asset allocation system where um, we group assets into growth assets, which are on the top part of this chart, and then low beta, um, or ones that are diversifying, and other, which diversify as well. And so growth assets are designed to be generative over time, and low beta and other are supposed to um, diversify your assets and protect on the downside. Um, and so you can see here that your current allocation has a 75-25 split. Um, you can see at the bottom that it has a, a 20 year expected return of 7.1%. Um, that's an average annual return. So we'd expect that um, about half of the time you have a return higher than that, which hopefully we will this year um, as your CIO reported returns. And then about half of the time you'd have a return below that for an average of 7.1% per year over the long term. The Vera's calculated standard deviation um, is 12.7% here. And you can see um, a um, comparison of the different mixes. And so mix A has less in growth. It has a 71-29 split, you can see at the top, has a expected return of 6.9% and a various standard deviation of 12.4. Mix B has more assets in growth. So you can see a 79-21 split has a higher expected return of 7.3 and also a higher standard deviation of 13.4. Mix C um, has a 70-30 split, so less in growth, a lower expected return, 
And then this option we really wanted to show you in case you wanted to um, adhere um, sort of strictly to that 12% um, risk limit in your IPS. So mix C has a standard deviation as calculated by Beerus that's below that 12% limit at 11.7. Just for comparison purposes, we wanted to show you an allocation. Um, imagine that you did not invest in any private assets that were um, not at least uh, quarterly liquid. You would see an expected return of 6.1 um, and a standard deviation of 11.5. And then we also wanted to show you a 60-40 split of global equity and investment grade bonds, since that's something that market observers quote quite a bit um, as a, a broad benchmark. That would be expected to have a return of 5.4 and a standard deviation of 10 points. Um, so as page eight just uh, talks about what I just did in terms of um, the uh, qualitative sort of assessment of these um, these allocations. And then page nine, we wanted to show you um, peer allocations, which as we've discussed before, I think you should take with a grain of salt because these are all self-reported. Um, some plans break out, say, emerging markets equity. Some just group it in with um, global equity or um, international um, non-US equity. But you can see here that in terms of medians, um, the median fund has um, total equity of 49%. Um, it has um, emerging markets for those that break it out. Um, it says five, I would say the, um, the average plan probably has a higher allocation to emerging markets because of those that do group it in with others. Um, and so you can see um, the, the allocation that, that we're showing you for Fed current has a 49% total equity allocation. And so your total equity for the current is sort of right on the nose with, with peers. Um, as you know, you know, for many years, it was, it was far below that. Um, but in the asset allocation that you adopted about a year ago, you brought um, peer risk um, back closer to the peer group. Um, we get into um, MVO-based risk analysis or mean variance optimization-based risk analysis on page 10. You can see here for the one year period, we'd expect a worst case scenario return of um, more than 20% down. Um, if you look at the other allocations we're showing you here, Mrs. A, B, and C, there's not a huge difference and that difference gets smaller over time. So if you take a look at um, say a 10 year period, um, the worst case scenario we'd say would be a 2.7% negative return. Looking at mix C, if you recall, which was less risky, that would be negative 2.4. So just a 0.3% difference there over a long period of time. The probability of experiencing negative returns is also quite similar right around that 30% down mark for each of the mixes that we're looking at. The probability of achieving your 6.625% assumed rate of return is in the bottom um, third of this, this page. And you can see here that um, all of uh, the, uh, the mixes that we're looking at um, the current versus mixes A, B, and C all have an over 50% probability of achieving that assumed rate of return um, based on our analysis. And that's usually a threshold that um, the clients we work with and funds that we work with like to use is to make sure that their, um, their allocation is expected to hit at least a 50% probability of their return. And just one thing to keep in mind as well is that we're looking at beta returns or sort of broad market returns for each of these asset classes. So in asset classes where you outperform the broad market benchmark, which you have um, definitely, especially in the past few years, um, we'd expect a higher return than what this analysis predicts. Um, taking a look at the next slide, I will turn it over for a moment to, um, to Jared. Thanks, Laura. So this slide shows historical negative uh, events. We're basically looking at how did certain asset classes perform historically and then what exposure do each of these mixes have to those asset classes. So uh, just to make you aware, like the current Fed mix is, is not showing you how we actually performed uh, during these historical events. It's just based on uh, market exposures and how those markets performed at the time. Uh, so something like the second line was the financial crisis. Uh, you can see that the current mix will kind of perform in the middle of some of the other options. Mix B being the most aggressive option performs the worst and mix C would perform uh, the relative best. And that makes sense based on the allocations. Uh, there's also a COVID uh, scenario at the very bottom. And again, the current mix falls in the middle. Going to the next page, we go the other way here with um, a lot of these are bounce backs from the previous page. 
Uh, and again, the current mix is in the middle of some of the, of the other options. Um, a different way to look at it is through stress testing, or you might call this scenario analysis, uh, what if analysis, and basically looking at, you know, if, if certain events here on the left happen, what do we think uh, will, the result would be for these different asset mixes? Uh, so these events are largely negative or would, uh, would generate negative results. Um, there's not a ton of difference option to option, and it would take a pretty big uh, move in credit spreads uh, kind of there in the middle or a, a large equity drawdown to see a, a notable drawdown at, at the um, asset at the plan level. Uh, but again, the current mix is in the middle of some of the other options. And on page 14, these go the other way where uh, these generate um, some nice positive results uh, through stress testing. Uh, and again, pretty similar results uh, through each one. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to Laura. Great, thank you, Jared. Um, the last piece of analysis we have here on pension is economic regime management analysis. Um, this is something we developed mainly because um, we noticed that asset classes perform differently um, not necessarily based on high or low absolute inflation or other um, metrics, but more based on what the market was expecting relative to what actually um, occurred in the market. So if you take a look at the next slide, you can see each mix's exposure to factors like growth, inflation, interest rates, and systemic risk. Um, you can see that um, the higher risk allocations have more exposure to growth, meaning in an environment where growth is rewarded, they would have higher returns. Um, if you look at, say, interest rates, you can see that the public option has a, um, a negative correlation there. It has more exposure to, to broad bonds. Um, so you'd, um, you'd also see here systemic risk that the riskier allocations, like mix B has the highest standard deviation for volatility would um, have the most exposure to an environment of systemic risk, which is similar to like a global financial crisis or COVID risk environment. Um, so this just takes a look at, um, at how these uh, allocations would react um, to these changes and surprises in these factors. Um, and then one thing um, that um, your CIO mentioned, we also wanted to bring up when it comes to the pension is um, benchmarking. Um, we reviewed all of the benchmarks in the investment policy statement and collaborated with staff to look at whether or not they were all still the most appropriate. And so you can see here on page 17, the recommended benchmark components, nearly all of them we think should remain in place, which is what you would want to do is um, benchmark over a long period of time. But we do have on page 18, a few recommendations for some small tweaks. Um, on page 18 at the top, you can see that for core real estate, right now we're using the NACREF of the National Council of Real Estate Investors um, open-ended uh, core equal weighted benchmark. Equal weighted means that all of the underlying funds in the universe are equally weighted, including those that might be very small or take on different degrees of risk. Um, most um, benchmarks are market cap weighted, and so we'd recommend switching to the same benchmark, but the um, cap weighted version you can see here the difference in returns over the long period of time. Um, the cap-weighted version we realized is much more widely used. And then we also recommend lagging it one quarter, um, mainly because some of your statements from managers don't come in until, um, until after the quarter end. And so that would better match up with your actual um, manager statements. For market neutral strategies right now, um, the SAAP, um, we'd recommend updating um, to T-bills are cash plus one and a half percent, which is harder to beat than the T-bills plus one percent, but is more reflective of what's actually in your portfolio. For immunized cash flows, we'd recommend changing um, the low-cost um, passive benchmark um, from just cash to the Bloomberg Barclays one to three-year government credit index. Um, this is also harder to beat um, as a benchmark, but is, again, more representative of what's actually in your portfolio. Um, and then if we take a look at long-term government bonds, um, we're using the Bloomberg Barclays Treasury 10 plus benchmark, which we found is exactly the same as the Barclays US Long Treasury, but the Barclays US Long Treasury um, is easier to find in um, your custodian's um, benchmark reporting system. So all of these we believe are relatively small changes to your benchmark, um, but we wanted to bring them up at this time while we talk about asset allocation. 
Um, so we also have a section in this on, on the healthcare trust asset allocation, but I believe I'll turn it back over to um, your CIO and perhaps Viris to talk more about their analysis on the pension. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have a presentation from Veris, uh, also yes. focused on strategic asset allocation. And I would recommend that uh, we wait for Eileen and Danny to make their presentation uh, before opening it up for discussion. And I know this is a lot of material for trustees to digest. So I also recommend that we tackle uh, the pension first before we move on to healthcare. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, Eileen? Thank you, um, Pabu and Mr. Chair. I will share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, and can you hear me all right? Yes. Sure. Okay, yeah, thank you. great. Uh, well, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, our presentation is under 3F.2 uh, of your packet. And we will begin on slide two. And this is just a summary of, um, first of all, the fact that we're going to um, spend uh, just a couple minutes talking about the risk limits that are reflected in your investment policy statement and that were established by you as a board and uh, the variables that uh, fed to those risk limits. We'll talk about that more in a moment. In terms of the strategic asset allocation um, and the set of mixes that you are reviewing today that Laura just uh, reviewed in her presentation, uh, just a, a few comments. Uh, first, with respect to the established risk limit of 12% of these various options we're looking at, most are either under at um, or at that risk limit. There is one mix that is a higher growth mix that is outside of that risk limit. We do observe that any increases in volatility are um, a function of taking on more equity risk. And we determine that by looking at the contribution to risk from equities, as well as measuring the equity beta of these various mix alternatives. Another key source of risk for institutional portfolios is interest rate risk as, as measured by duration. And uh, our observation is that the duration risk of the current portfolio and the alternatives that we're looking at today, none of those uh, really reflect a meaningful amount of duration risk or interest rate risk. The durations are relatively short. And as we look at the mixes compared to each other under different scenarios, uh, we don't really see meaningful differences in the outcomes, particularly in those outlier stress or shock events. So with that, we'll turn to the next slide and, and Danny will make a couple of comments about the risk limit framework. Sure, thank you, Eileen. Um, so just as a reminder of, you know, there's been a discussion today about the 12% risk limit. We thought it would be useful to revisit how that limit was, uh, how the board arrived at that risk limit and, and the framework that was used for that. So basically, this, uh, this exhibit here just distills that discussion down that happened over several months into the three component parts that were used to determine that. First is risk tolerance. So you know, there were interviews with board members to determine risk tolerance and determine how much risk the, the board uh, wanted to take for the plan. Uh, second was understanding the relationship between portfolio volatility and what that would mean for potential drawdowns that the plan may have. Uh, and then, of course, those things are interrelated. So as you, as you look at a potential drawdown, it can further change or reinforce what your risk tolerance is. And then the third component is understanding what a drawdown may mean for the financial condition of the plan. And so to understand that, that's really looking at uh, the actuarial, uh, kind of the actuarial conditions, understanding what it would mean for the city in terms of contributions, what it would mean for funding status if you had a drawdown in, in a single year. So this is the framework. If we move on to the next slide, we can show explicitly 
kind of how that how the volatility drawdown and risk tolerance framework uh, works, it, it, putting putting hard numbers behind this this uh, this idea. So there's a lot going on in this page, and I'm not going to dive into everything unless there are specific questions. But I'll tell you what's happening here. It's, so the first column is looking at portfolio volatility, just looking at 8% risk all the way up to 15% risk. And then the columns to the right of that are just different ways that the board could define a drawdown event. There's no industry standard of exactly how you should define a drawdown event, but these are some different ways that other institutions define drawdown events. So value at risk, conditional value at risk, and the the uh, and we have different percentiles or different confidence, confidence intervals. And the one to the far right is thinking about historical scenarios. So what's actually happened historically and, and looking at the three worst historical scenarios. So what this table basically allows you to do is think about how different levels of volatility can, can correspond to different levels of drawdowns. And so as you go through this and look at these different numbers, you can move on to the next slide, which actually tells you if you were to experience some of these different drawdowns, how, what would the financial uh, impact be on the plan? And so here we have two different tables. The first table looks at the worst case in a single year over a 10 year projection, right? So how bad would it get uh, if you're, uh, if you suffered a 20% drawdown or a 25 or 30% drawdown. And the single year we have our baseline. So, so baseline is the first, uh, the first experience there. And that basically says, if everything goes according to our assumptions, our funding ratio today is the lowest we expect it to be because we expect to hit our assumed rate of return and grow through time. But if we suffer a drawdown, uh, we can see what the impact would be in the worst year for funding ratios and for city contributions. And then the, the two columns to the right there show you what that change would mean. So funding status under a 20% drawdown means your funding ratio at its lowest point would fall to 45% from the current 52%. So it's a 7% difference. And city contributions would increase in a single year by 58 million. The, uh, a more uh, comprehensive way to think about the impact of a drawdown, because drawdowns get smoothed over, over longer periods of time, would be to look at a 10-year period, right? And so that's what the second table does, is it says, what's the cumulative impact of a drawdown on this plan? So the assumption here, again, is in a single year, you experience a 20% drawdown. And then every subsequent year from there, you hit your assumed rate of return. So what would that mean for after it? Uh, after a 10 year period for your funding ratio and for city contributions, uh, you can see what that would, what that would mean uh, in terms of absolute and relative terms in that table down there. And so when we had this discussion initially with the board, uh, the board kind of uh, put, put a stake in the ground at a basically a 25% drawdown and that inferred about a 12% uh, level of volatility for the plan. So that's that's where, where the board uh, initially uh, put a stake in the ground, but it's up to the board to determine what is best for you and what is best for the plan. Um, but this was the framework that was used initially. So uh, with all of that, I'll turn it back over to Eileen to actually discuss some of the results of the risk allocation study. Thank you, Danny. So we turn to the next slide, slide six. And here we're comparing the um, various policy alternatives versus the current policy um, under uh, Veris's uh, risk modeling framework. I think uh, an important distinction to make here is uh, a lot of times in your performance reports and other reports that you may be looking at investment related reports, volatility is a measure of standard deviation of returns and it is um, basically returns based or backward looking based on the actual experience of the um, portfolio. Here, we're looking at the underlying exposures and looking at current levels of volatility in the market based on those exposures to come up with the overall portfolio exposure. So in, in technical terms, this is ex ante as opposed to 
ex post, which is normally how volatility is discussed in the context of investments. And, and what this is basically inferring is that um, based upon the exposures you have on, and, the, and the level of market volatility today, this is what these various policy alternatives reflect um, on that ex ante or forward looking basis. So the current policy is um, slightly higher or higher than that 12% limit. When we looked at this a year ago, it was uh, well under the 12% limit, about a percent lower in terms of volatility versus what we're seeing today. And so that is a reflection of the elevated levels of volatility we're seeing, not just in the equity markets, but in other markets as well. Uh, the three policy alternatives, policy mix A and C, both reflect slightly lower growth postures, and so they reflect uh, lower volatility relative to the current policy, whereas mix B is a higher growth and uh, therefore a higher risk portfolio. So that is, well exceeds that 12% limit. The all public alternative um, does fall somewhere uh, below the other uh, policy mix alternatives. And, and that's not surprising because in particular with respect to your private equity and venture exposures, those are meant to be your highest growth exposures and have the highest levels of volatility associated with them. And then finally, the 60-40, sort of the naive um, alternative uh, demonstrates the lowest level of volatility because that is essentially just uh, government bonds and equities. The uh, information that you saw in the Makita presentation reflected the um, capital allocations associated with each of these policy mixes. On this slide, slide seven, we're looking at the allocation of risk across the various key risk drivers of portfolio returns. So on, on the bottom of the chart, you can see those key risk drivers and, and the colors associated with them. So you can uh, relate those to those various um, uh, policy mix bars. So for, for all of these policy mixes, regardless of that capital allocation to equity risk exposure, so that would be public equities and private equities, the um, uh, contribution to overall risk from that exposure far exceeds the capital allocation. If you think back to the capital allocation, your equity allocations are in the neighborhood of 40% uh, or so of your assets, but the contribution to risk from those equity exposures is north of 80%. What I think is interesting and what people don't realize when they're comparing diversified mixes such as your current policy and these other policy alternatives relative to that 60-40 naive mix is the contribution to risk from equities in that mix is even higher because of the lower diversification. So uh, to me, that's one affirmation of the benefits of diversification is you do, even if it's a higher quote growth and maybe higher volatility portfolio, you're actually diversifying the contribution or reducing the contribution to risk from that very volatile uh, asset class of equities. If we turn to the next slide, um, we look at the equity beta. So here we're uh, trying to make a, um, an assessment of how correlated to the equity markets, these various policy mix alternatives are, so that when equities draw down, what is, what is the probability or the likelihood that these are gonna draw down in the same degree? And you could see for the current policy, pretty high correlation, 0.7. So if equities draw down, this portfolio will have a drawdown in a similar um, uh, trend, but maybe not to the same degree, about 70% of the equity drawdown, if you think about it that way. And the other policy mixes, other than mix B, offer somewhat of a lower drawdown, but 
actually, I, I think we're being a little bit misleading in the precision of these metrics. They really probably should be rounded. And when you round them, they basically all round to either, you know, 0.7 or between 0.6 and 0.8. Uh, the lowest, again, uh, uh, correlation to equities is the 60-40 mix with the 60%. It would draw down roughly 60% of what the equity drawdown would be in any given period. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the um, second key risk driver of any in institutional portfolio is interest rate risk exposure. And we measure that through the duration statistic. And we're looking here at the um, interest rate duration and the credit spread duration or the duration associated with the credit exposures in the portfolio. And so for the current portfolio, you know, 1.3 years and a half a year credit risk duration, we would say that's pretty low interest rate risk exposure. Interestingly, and, and not surprisingly, if you compare that to the naive 60-40 portfolio, uh, you could see there's a higher duration risk associated with that 40% um, fixed income allocation. But again, as we compare all of these portfolios, while the durations may vary, particularly the interest rate duration sensitivity, uh, they're not meaningful differences and they're not meaningful duration exposures or duration risk exposures. We look at how these portfolios on this slide um, would have performed in the various crisis environments that we've observed uh, in, in modern times. And for most of these sort of crisis or drawdown where equities drew down meaningfully environments, um, the drawdowns from a total portfolio perspective aren't super um, uh, meaningful other than in the tech crash and in the subprime and credit risk environment. So the drawdowns are 10% or less, and we would say that's within normal expectations, frankly, for a, an equity-oriented portfolio. But the environments that have potentially meaningful impacts on our funded status are ones such as the subprime uh, uh, and credit crisis environment and the tech crash environments where we're drawing down close to 30% and, and 40%. And here's where you probably see the biggest distinction in the various mix alternatives. So the current policy is the dark bar and the 60-40 being the green bar. And um, the, the, the current portfolio will likely draw down in these environments worse than some of these other policy alternatives, the exception being the higher growth mix B. But again, in the magnitude it is not too differentiated. Uh, you know, whether you're drawing down 28% versus say 26%, they're both very big drawdowns. And that 3% differential uh, shouldn't be a factor in the decision making um, when they're this close. We also looked at what if scenarios. So, what if uh, various stresses in the markets occur, such as a drawdown in commodities or credit spreads blow out by 100 basis points, equities draw down, interest rates increase uh, by 200 basis points. The current portfolio has very low commodity exposure, so it's not surprising. And, and none of the mixes that we looked at have um, a very meaningful commodity exposure. So uh, commodities were to draw down meaningfully, uh, that really isn't expected to have um, a, a, a very large impact on the portfolio. The only scenario that we would expect uh, a large impact on the portfolio is that global equity drawdown of 20%. Here, we would expect the portfolio to draw down, as we saw from the beta earlier, you know, 70% as much, and that's kind of what these results show. And the results are pretty close in between these portfolio mixes with the current policy drawing down just slightly more. I think everybody's worried about inflation right now. It's certainly what all the 
talk is in, in, in economic circles and investment circles. And if you look at this scenario, this global interest rates plus 200 basis points, that's sort of the, the, the drawdown risk associated with, say, a um, un, unanticipated spurt of inflation growth. And we would expect to see the portfolio draw down, but you can see you know, it's not to the level or degree that we observed in some of those other historical environments on the prior page. So I wouldn't get too um, twisted around the axle, if you will, about uh, inflation fears, given um, your portfolio exposures and our expectations based on those exposures. We also looked at the, or isolated the COVID shock environment, because that certainly represented um, a, a very distressed period back in uh, March and April of last year. And you could see the current portfolio draw down roughly about 26%. The other portfolios drawing down slightly less, but still in excess of 20% in that type of environment. But as we know, we've had quite the um, snapback and that has not had a prolonged um, or uh, deleterious effect on your funded status. And that really concludes our formal comments and happy to turn it back over to um, Prabhu and to you all for discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen and Danny for that excellent presentation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to hand this back to Laura. Uh, to pick up on slide seven of the Makita presentation and uh, talk about the alternatives that were presented at the IC and now before the full board. Very good, thank you. Thank you. So yes, flipping back to slide seven, you can see the overall comparison of the options. Um, as you know, the current allocation was adopted um, just about a year ago. Um, it has worked out quite well for the plan. Um, it still has an expected return um, over the actuarial assumed rate of return, and we think it remains very reasonable. Um, and so we recommend continuing to consider um, uh, maintaining the current allocation um, with the understanding that the VRS calculated standard deviation is above the, um, the stated guideline in the IPS. Laura, do you want to uh, briefly comment on the other mixes, um, just in terms of the high level changes? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the main changes are um, a decline in growth for the ones that have um, less risk and a lower return. Um, and, um, and mix B, um, we wanted to show you an option with um, higher risk and higher return as well. Um, I will note that mix C, um, we took emerging markets equity down from the current 12% to 9%, which is closer um, to the peer group and the um, MSCI all country world index allocation to emerging markets. Um, we did um, look at a slightly lower allocation to venture capital in mixes A and C. Um, that's not a reflection of us changing um, or staff changing um, sort of the attractiveness of venture capital, but more an acknowledgement of the fact that it takes a long time to scale up to an allocation there. And that we will likely be reevaluating asset allocation again um, before you get close to that, that three or 4% in, uh, in venture capital. Um, I also wanted to note that, you know, Eileen mentioned a bit about a possible inflationary environment. Um, we did add in um, mix A, an allocation of 2% to commodities which is a sort of inexpensive um, liquid way of getting exposure to inflation hedging assets. Um, other differences here, you can see um, mainly the investment grade bond allocation is one of the ways that we toggle the risk up and down um, near the bottom of the slide here. Is there anything, any of the high points, Prabhu, that you think I missed there? So thanks, Laura. That was great. Uh, the, the only thing I would add is we've spent some time on focusing on that 12% number as the drawdown. And I would just point out that you see the very standard deviation here in the last row. Uh, the current mix is 12.7. The other options presented are all sort of in that ballpark. There's some false precision here. I mean, these are risk forecast risk models uh, where we actually end up uh, you know, is, is probably going to be somewhat, somewhat different from these exact numbers, but they're all in the ballpark. And I would look at the 12% more as a target than as a limit. 
um, the limits apply more to the to staff and IC. The board has no limits. And so they're all within that um, ballpark of 12%. And um, as an aside, as a future project, uh, we, we did this study with Veris uh, three or four years, four years ago now. And at some point we may want to revisit that whole risk tolerance project. Uh, but with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn this back to you for discussion. Okay. And um, Mr. Polani, just to clarify, are, are you looking for action on the uh, pension al asset allocation before we um, take action on the healthcare trust as well as the benchmark change, I believe, right? Yeah, those are the three things that I'm looking for guidance from the board. And uh, you can either have three separate motions or you can do it in one motion, I believe. So I leave that to you. Okay, well, let's um, let's focus in on the pension asset allocation first. So with that, yeah, I'd like to open it to questions, comments, reactions from trustees, protect, particularly um, perhaps um, from IC members who had a, uh, an earlier opportunity to, to digest the information. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. In fact, I was gonna ask you if you wanted um, the investment committee members to add Thank some you. comments. Thank you very uh, much. And, uh, yeah, Trustee Kelleher is not present. Uh, Trustee Orr is, so she can share her thoughts as well. Um, I, I think I feel comfortable summarizing the investment committee's uh, conclusions, and then I'll sort of uh, elaborate with, with my own personal uh, thoughts. Uh, we supported the recommendation to maintain the asset allocation. In fact, I think we may have uh, come to that conclusion um, on our own before uh, staff or the consultants uh, had suggested it. So it was nice that there was some alignment there. Um, for me, the decision is driven by a few factors. One, um, you know, for us to get back to a, let's just say more, f a better funded plan, uh, we do have to take a, a bit more risk. Um, and as I looked at these models, um, the incremental risk that we are taking with the current allocation is not significant from a stress test or a drawdown perspective, which I think uh, the Veris guys did a really good job of walking us through. Um, so that was factor number one. Factor number two is I'm personally not a big fan of rejiggering strategic asset allocations, certainly on an annual basis, unless there's some black swan event or some significant drawdown that forces us into a uh, defensive position. Um, or as the CIO and his staff brought to us about a year ago, an opportunity to, uh, to change strategic asset allocation for some offensive purpose. Um, but I don't think we're in either of those environments right now. These projections are 10 to 20 year projections. Um, tinkering with them annually upsets the model. You never give a chance, you never give the portfolio a chance to, to bake you know, or, or for the bread to, uh, to leaven. And, uh, I, uh, and yeah, for those reasons, I strongly believe that uh, the current allocation looks good. Um, there may be little features here and there of the other allocations that are interesting, but nothing that was persuasive enough to suggest changing. Great, thank you very much. Trustee Orr, are you in a position to comment? I don't know if you wanted to, um, you are also on IC. Okay, she may still be on the road. Um, other um, questions or comments from other trustees? Well, I have a, a, a couple of observations and uh, a question or two. This is Trustee Horowitz. Yes. Um, at the top level, I, I agree very much with uh, what uh, trustee just said, I, I believe the, the overall growth uh, diversification split 75-25, I think makes uh, great sense. Um, and so I, I do support that 75-25 uh, split. Um, where I might have some question is in some of the allocations to the specific assets underneath that. I think over this past year, we have enjoyed um, great success uh, due to our reallocation to growth assets. And I would hope in the future, we can benefit by the magic of 
of reallocation and rebalancing so that if growth assets were to have a drawdown, uh, we, we would be in a position to leverage that, take advantage of that, and move back into growth assets and reallocate. And to that end, I have some concerns that we have a very large allocation in the current allocation to private assets of various types that it will be difficult for us to extract ourselves from those illiquid assets to redeploy to uh, marketable equities. Um, and I would love to see uh, the, the staff and Makita uh, propose a mix that had somewhat smaller allocations to the various private assets. And in that regard, it's very instructive to look at the, they do offer us the quote public mix uh, where we can observe the expected returns and standard deviation. Um, and if that public mix is meant to illustrate the difference between a purely public portfolio with a mixed public and private portfolio, I I'm not sure it quite hits the nail uh, because the top level growth mix is so different, 65-35. It would be more instructive if we could see how the numbers play out and all the scenarios play out if that was a 75-25 mix. So uh, th those are, are my first top level comments. Uh, I think that's an excellent point on, um, on the liquidity of the portfolio. So the, um, the private markets target in the current portfolio is 21%. Um, one thing that I think gives me comfort if we were to have a major drawdown and wanted to um, you know, have liquidity to put more into, say, public equities is the fact that, um, that over 6% of the private market's target is still in the Russell 3000. So because we have pacing plans that get to these private market's targets over a long period of time, a lot, you know, your, your target is 21%, but your actual allocation to private assets is less than 15% today. So, and, and within any one year, um, there won't be a large percentage of that, that target called. Um, so I think, you know, while the, the allocation does have, you know, a hefty allocation, but that's still probably lower than many peers to private assets, um, you would have still the flexibility um, over, you know, a multi-year period of pulling those assets out should there be a major market event that, that you would want to reallocate. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? I'll also support the recommendation to stay with the current asset allocation. I wanted to follow up with Eileen or Danny. Um, the 12%, uh, uh, the, the 12, the standard deviation of 12 that as a benchmark, that um, was uh, developed, by Mr. Vipalani, was that four years ago you said? Yes. Reviews, yeah. And typically, how often do you do that um, assessment with the boards? How often do you revisit that number? I, I think a good time frame is between three and five years. So the fact that we're at four, we probably should uh, be getting it on the calendar for you all and be working with staff in revisiting our enterprise risk analysis. Um, that would be our uh, recommendation. Okay, yeah. Um, Mr. Polani, it looked like you were going to say something there. No, I was just going to share the same thoughts, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, for last time, even uh, Trustee Chandra, our most tenured trustee, was not here. So we've turned over completely since, um, mm. since that last time. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, very good. Um, any other questions, comments? If not, I'll take a motion in a second to. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, with regard to the pension asset allocation. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yes. just wanted to relay a message from Trustee Orr that she can't comment. Uh, she's having trouble uh, being able to comment with her iPhone, but that she fully, she's fully aligned with the IC chair recommendation and comments. Okay, very good. Thank you. 
Um, all right. Well, with that, could I have a motion in a second? And if the motion, if it aligns with the recommendation, would be to uh, continue with the current um, asset allocation in the federated pension plan. Yeah, I'll make such a motion. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. Hi, it's Elaine. I'll second it. Oh, thank you, uh, Trustee Orr. Good to have you back. Any other uh, questions, uh, comments before we vote? All right. Uh, with that, Vice Chair Horowitz. While I agree with the 75 25 split, uh, I am going to vote no uh, because I believe we should also be evaluating a mix with a somewhat lower commitment to illiquid assets to maintain our flexibility to respond to uh, upcoming situations. So I'm going to vote no. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Chandra? Uh, I vote yes. Thank you, Trustee Jennings? I vote yes. Thank you, Trustee Kelleher, still not here. Okay, and Trustee Orr. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, so that she votes. Um, Yes, also council, is that good? Um, can we count that vote? Uh, yes, and, and let's also, uh, if she is able to patch back in and confirm that later, that'll be fine, but since she was- a Hi, second, it's Trustee Orr, I vote and, aye. Uh, thank you, thank you, Trustee Orr. Never thank mind. You, council. <laughs> I also vote um, yes, so that motion carries five to one. All right. Uh, I think next. that's four to one. That is correct. Four, four to one, yes. That's right, four to one, thank you. Okay, um, and then um, uh, Mr. Pawnee, do you wanna queue up the asset allocation on the healthcare trust? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, but before we do that, uh, I would actually appreciate a motion on uh, slide 17 as well um to oh. adopt the recommended benchmarks so that we can make the appropriate changes in the investment policy statement thank you yes do you need a motion Jay? i do a motion in a second um to um to make the, the benchmarks Yes, identified on page 1718. Yeah, I'll, I'll make such a motion. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Any other discussion by the board? Any public discussion? All right, roll call vote. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Thank you. Jay, did you say something? Trustee Jennings? Aye. Yes, thank you. Um, and Trustee Orr? Aye. Thank you. I also would aye. That motion carries five to zero. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will now uh, turn this back to Laura for a discussion on the healthcare trust allocation. Great. Uh, thank you. So, um, in contrast to the retirement system where the expected return based on our updated capital market assumptions, um, exceeds the expected rate of return, um, the healthcare trust um, is different. So if we skip to the next slide here, um, you can see that the current healthcare trust um, expected return for the 20 year period is 5.8%. Um, the current actuarial um, target rate of return for healthcare is 6.25%, but has come down if you recall, it used to always track the pension trust, um, but now you have voted that healthcare um, has a 6.25% assumed uh, rate of return. Um, another, another thing um, about the healthcare current allocation is that it's not really um, uniform in strategy with your pension trust. 
So because we made sort of an interim um, cycle change to the pension asset allocation a year ago, um, and then implemented it over a period of time, we didn't at that time update the healthcare trust. So we're now trying to get back on the cycle that we update the healthcare trust or at least take a fresh look at it every time we do an asset allocation review for the pension. So this healthcare trust current allocation doesn't really mirror the strategy um, of the pension in that it has almost 30% in short-term investment grade bonds. Um, it also doesn't uh, meet the, um, the expected return um, that you've set for the healthcare trust. So therefore, we recommend taking a look at these alternative um, mixes A through C. Um, so you can see here that mix A would be expected to meet the uh, expected rate of return, our target rate of return for the healthcare trust with a 20-year average annual expected, expected return of 6.3%. Um, we show here um, the uh, Makita standard deviation of 12.1. Um, there isn't a, a risk guideline um, for the healthcare trust in your policy statement. Um, so we're just showing the Makita standard deviation, but it's fair to say that the Vera standard deviation is always lower than ours um, based on them using um, actual volatility rather than, than some of our forward expectations. So you can assume that all of the mixes we're showing here are below a 12% standard deviation given um, if Vera's were to calculate them. Um, you can take a look at mix B here, which has an expected rate of return of 6% um, and a Makita standard deviation of 11.3 and mix C with an expected return of 5.7. And I'll point out that all of these mixes, these alternative mixes A through C shift um, from that huge uh, short-term bond um, allocation to one that looks more in line with the pension fund. So a 5% allocation to short-term investment grade bonds, which is similar to what you have in immunized cash flows in the pension. Um, and then the rest of the bond exposure is shifted to sort of market duration um, investment grade bonds and long-term government bonds, similar to sort of um, some of the, the uh, strategy that you have in the pension. Um, you do have a 5% commodities weight in healthcare that we recommend um, maintaining with these alternative mixes. So really the differences here are, um, are the main difference at least is shifting the duration of the bond. Um, taking a look at the next slide here, or actually two slides ahead, we can look at the comparison to peers. One thing that we've always talked about is that um, most um, health funds, health and welfare funds have a really conservative asset allocation. Um, that's been difficult um, to mirror for your plan because your expected target return here has always been the same as the pension. So it's hard to take off too much risk and try to, um, to attain a you know, over 6% um, rate of return. So you can see here that the median health and welfare trust, and this is about 200 plans depending on, on their reporting, has only about 30% in equity um, and over 60% in fixed income. So um, most health and welfare funds um, don't look like a typical pension fund and aren't expected to get the target rate of return that, that you all have set and your actuary has set for the healthcare trust. So just want to keep that in mind. Um, and that's something that we'll continue to point out when we, when we look at performance on a peer relative basis. Um, the mean variance optimization based risk analysis starts on um, page 24. You can see here the worst case scenario returns and you know, very similar to the pension fund, there's not a big difference um, in worst case scenario returns or the probability of experiencing a negative return between these mixes. So the, the, the amount that the risk or the return toggles up or down doesn't have a huge you know, impact on drawdown risk. You can see that the probability of experiencing negative returns in a one year period is, is close to 30% for all of these mixes. The probability of achieving a 6.25% um, return is the highest with mix A, and that's because mix A's expected return essentially matches your, um, your target rate of return and rounds to about a 50% probability. Um, Jared's going to mention just a couple points on the next couple slides as well. Thanks, Laura. Uh, similar, not, not mixed to mix. Um, in general, you know, mix C is the most conservative option, so it performs the best in down market scenarios. Um, on, uh, looking at these historical scenarios, and then on the flip side, mix A uh, is the best looking option um, in positive markets. 
looking at a couple of stress test uh, situations here. So again, pretty similar and not a huge uh, downward move except for a large blowout in credit spreads there in the middle or a large equity decline there toward the bottom. Uh, again, going down, mixed C looks the best. And then on the next page, going back up, mixed C uh, trails the other options. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to Laura. All right, um, so just um, to comment on this last type of analysis, economic regime management analysis on page 30, we can see here, you know, as you'd expect, um, the 60-40 mix has a lot more equity in it, and so it's more exposed to growth, um, and also a lot more investment grade bonds um, in terms of interest rate exposure. But you can see here that mix A would um, have the most exposure to a growth market environment, but then also um, have uh, more systemic risk than your current um, allocation. So in summary, we'd recommend considering um, uh, a, one of the alternative asset allocations, um, mainly given um, the fact that the healthcare current allocation, if we flip back to page 21, um, you know, sort of uses an old strategy that we were using for the pension fund that has since been updated with all of those short-term investment grade bonds. And also, um, uh, the current is not expected to um, perform um, in line with your, your target return. OK, very good. Thank you. Questions and comments uh, and or comments from uh, trustees? Mr. Polani, did you have anything you wanted to add before we start discussion? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point, it out, point out that uh, it's been a while since we actually changed this allocation, as Ms. Weirich pointed out. Uh, since then, uh, we usually try to change the healthcare allocation along with and in line with the pension. Uh, but uh, because of the changes that we've made, uh, the frequent changes that we've made to pension in the last couple of years, uh, healthcare has not uh, kept up. So I think it's time we changed it uh, if we need to do it. And certainly, as she pointed out, you know, mix A takes on a little bit more risk and decreases uh, short-term bonds, uh, which we used, we used to have a big allocation to short-term bonds on the pension side. And the current healthcare trust allocation reflects that. And maybe it's time to move away from that. OK, thank you. Questions, comments? So this is Trustee Jennings. So the, the recommendation um, would be to go to mix A? Yes, that would be um, in line with your target return and uh, keeping with the pension strategy. Uh, and just to follow up, was there a recommendation, recommendation that came out of the IC? From, from what I recall, um, the IC members can correct me if I'm wrong, but there was agreement that we should change the asset allocation. Um, I, I don't recall if there was a specific recommendation for which mix. Okay. Yeah, that, that's my recollection as well. We, we did not formally um, provide guidance. Okay. Laura, at, at a high level, can you talk about how the pen, the healthcare trust asset allocation is different from the pension and why? Sure. Yeah. So it's a you know as you know it's a much smaller fund in terms of assets. <clears throat> um, it also has I think a little bit more um, uncertainty around cash flows. Um, I guess um, you know uh, Prabhu had actually reached out to um, Bill Hallmark um, at Chiron to get some more information um, about um, sort of the dynamics um, from an actuarial perspective of the healthcare trust. And he noted that the changes in expectations can have um, a big impact um, uh, in terms of um, healthcare um, inflation and things like that. And also in terms of um, the plans offered and that sort of thing. So there's a lot that lends itself towards keeping this, this plan very liquid. Um, and, and that sort of aligns well also with it being a small asset base, so it's difficult to invest in, in private markets anyway. So you can see that there is an allocation to core real estate that's sort of as illiquid as we get in this plan, um, and that's mainly because core real estate is quarterly liquid. In practice, it's probably more like six to nine months liquid because there's a notice period, and if there were a down market environment, there could be a queue to get out. 
um, but it still, you know, should be liquid within a year. So um, there is a small sort of semi-liquid um, toehold in the fund um, for diversification purposes, but otherwise we have avoided all um, illiquid assets um, in order to keep this fund liquid. Thank you. Okay. Anyone care to make a motion? This is Trustee Horowitz again. I, I, I do have a question. Yes. I, I understand the attractiveness of mix A to increase the allocation to growth assets. What I have difficulty understanding is moving so many assets from short term investment grade bonds to investment grade and long term government bonds. This seems an enormously bad time to be increasing our bond duration. The, the yield curve has steepened enormously. Uh, so I, I, I cannot understand or advocate for increase in the duration of our bond portfolio here. I think that's um, that's a good point. Um, I um, I would just mention, you know, we're looking at a long term asset allocation for the fund, and also, um, you know, we've probably for the last ten years um, um, had the same concerns about, you know, should we stay short term? Is now a bad time to increase duration? It's just been um, incredibly difficult um, for even you know the smartest investors in the world to really predict um, interest rates and yield curves and that sort of thing. So we'd advocate for for looking more like peers in this space and more like the market duration, um, just from a long term perspective. Given that we don't have a strong view in the short term um, on rates or yields. Yeah, if I can just add, I think uh, there's two different things here. One is investment grade bonds and the other is long-term government bonds. Long-term government bonds typically are uh, very good diversifiers. Uh, in the case of a steep drawdown uh, in the equity markets, they're one of the few asset classes that can actually add value. Uh, in terms of investment grade bonds, uh, I agree with Laura. I mean, I have no expertise in timing the market and predicting interest rates or being tactical. So we are going with long-term capital market assumptions. And just to the point that you made, Trustee Horowitz, uh, when the yield curve steepens is when you actually want duration and not vice versa. Well, I think my point is it it's, has steepened and looks to steepen further. Uh, that may be so, but I am not qualified to make that uh, you know, prediction and, but if you have a background or if you know why uh, rates are going to steepen further in the next six to nine months, I'd be happy to hear that. Well, I think there's quite a bit of commentary despite um, what has been uh, mentioned here, the impossibility of predicting interest rates. I think there's a, uh, a rather large commentary at the moment of the possibility of rising inflation and rising interest rates and how increasing duration is not something that many or most investment professionals are looking at at this moment. Um, the, yes, it's a long-term allocation, but maybe next year is the year to go to that long-term allocation for in investment grade bonds. Um, the, the timing on this just seems very, uh, very unfortunate. Well, you can certainly, uh, we can certainly come back with other options. I would just point out to the board, uh, I, I give very little credence to Wall Street forecasts. And in fact, the best uh, bond managers and economists forecast interest rates every year at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, they almost all actually are incorrect. Uh, but if the board so wishes, we can come back with other alternatives. I would move that we come back with an alternative that does increase our growth allocation, but limits our new allocation to investment grade bonds and maintains the bulk of our short-term investment grade bonds, uh, well, something closer to the 29%, not, not rush to, to uh, move those out in duration and moving to a 14 or 20 or 25% allocation to longer term investment grade bonds. So I, I would move for a, a mix D that would look at that type of scenario. 
And Trustee Horowitz, do you have a duration in mind for the portfolio? I leave that to the expertise of staff, but just looking at the top level, I, I do not think our bond portfolio duration should be substantially increased at this point in time. Okay, I have very little expertise in duration management or prediction, but we will go back and play around with some numbers and come back with some options. Much appreciated. Okay. Um, is everybody, um, everybody else on board with that strategy? That means not taking action today. I'm sorry that I'm uh, remote today. I, I would much prefer if we could try to resolve it today. I mean, we know that it's an imperfect world and pretty near impossible for anyone to predict accurately. Sometimes it's luck more than skill. So if the board, my board members and staff and consultants are able, uh, maybe we can try and adjust everything right now. Would you care to make a motion, Trustee Orr? Uh, I would, but I don't have the notes in front of me. I, um, okay. in, in principle, I, I would move that we move forward with the recommendations as laid out by Makita. And I believe, uh, Laura, did you say it was mix A that you were recommending? Yes, I think um, staff and Makita um, uh, were both comfortable with mix A. Okay. Thank you. That, so, so please include that as uh, part of my motion. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion to move to mix A for the healthcare trust. For a second. I'll, I'll second that motion. Trustee Chandra seconds that motion, okay. <clears throat> Other discussion? Well, I would just point out that uh, in the spirit of gradualism, which was highly advocated when we were discussing the pension plan allocation just a few moments ago, I would say the move from 29% short term to 19% uh, intermediate to long term is a non gradual move. So I think we should consider a more gradual move out of the short term investment grade bond. Uh, and I think that is my key point. Uh, Trustee uh, Horowitz, <clears throat> and I obviously I, I defer to counsel on this issue, but um, sounds like you're also making uh, uh, a motion that that if it's second, then obviously the board can then vote on the two motions that will be uh, available, and then they can decide how to proceed. Is that is that a fair statement, Trustee Horowitz? Well, I hadn't made a specific motion. I, uh, Trustee Orr suggested we resolve this uh, today. I, I'm not opposed to that. I haven't offered an alternative. I could, but I thought we would first maybe discuss and vote on the first uh, the 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 uh, proposal before the board. But if uh, it's more effective, I will make a proposal. I think you're correct. I mean, uh, you could have the discussion on on the motion that is uh, on the table right now uh, and have further discussion, and uh, and then that will probably address uh, the issue. If, if the board have further discussion and they approve the motion, then the, then the issue will be resolved. Uh, and if they choose not to, then obviously there can be further uh, deliberation on. On, on your comments and suggestions, I suspect. Well, in the spirit of a fulsome discussion, I will propose an alternative, and that would be mix A, with the exception that short-term investment grade be reduced from 29 to 15% instead of 5%, and that uh, the balance be reduced from investment grade bonds. Okay, 29 to 15, okay. And then, um, so that 14% delta would be um, added to the investment grade bond. So that would be 28% under mix A? It, 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 yes, so that would okay. be. Uh... 
Okay. Uh, Chairman Castellano, uh, I, um, I think some of the points that Trustee Horowitz makes are totally reasonable. Um, in, in terms of uh, his his personal point of view on interest rate exposure, um, and, and we all have them. And as as our CIO pointed out, none of us have a crystal ball. But but I think it's reasonable. The thing I'm struggling with is uh, changing the mix right now on the fly without seeing what that does to important things like standard deviation, expected returns. Uh, makes it hard for me to. Um, select that. So I don't know if this is another motion or asking for, uh, maybe what we do is we, we um, uh, let me think this through. So a trustee R is, is suggesting we should try and resolve this today. I understand that um, because I, I think um, the difference between uh, the way mix A is presented and what trustee Harris is suggesting may not be, um, you know, in the long run, 10, 20 years, uh, a, a big magnitude difference. Having said that, I also understand why Trustee Horowitz would like to see it. I certainly can't vote on Mix A with any changes to it without seeing what it would look like. So I think this comes down to, for the entire board in terms of voting, do we want to push this off for to the next board meeting and have some more data presented on two versions of Mix A? Does that I sound a time in that I would agree on your hug and uh, and Sophie Horowitz and others not having sort of the full picture. Um, I'm certainly open to a uh, lengthier review. Um, if I could perhaps um, offer maybe an, an interim solution, um, one thing that some of our clients do is they will adopt an asset allocation as their long term mix, but then um, put in place some sort of plan to get there over a period of time. Um, for example, adopt mix A, um, but move um, from short term to uh, investment grade and long term bonds in, say, three tranches, one each quarter over the next three quarters, or three, you know, just for, for broad example. Um, I will say that in general, Nikita advocates for um, dollar cost averaging when making a big move. That said, we advocated for that a year ago, and um, and your staff and CIO made a very, very good call to move to the new pension asset allocation immediately, given what happened to the market. So there's always um, sort of the risk that, um, you know, moving in tranches um, is not advantageous as well. If I can add to what Laura just said, um, I do agree with Trustee Horowitz that we, we advocate uh, minimalism when it comes to changes. One of the reasons why this change looks somewhat drastic is because we haven't made a change in healthcare trust for a while. And it's finally time to make it catch up with uh, you know, the pension plan. And that's why it looks like uh, a pretty big change. Uh, though, of course, you know, uh, the change is still to non-growth assets. So the effect is probably gonna be minimum. But as Laura suggested, uh, I'm we're perfectly happy if uh, if mix A is the consensus to do it, you know, to actually leg into it uh, either on a quarterly basis or even a one year time frame. Uh, we could certainly do that as well. Personally, I, I strongly appreciate and support the comments of both uh, uh, Trustee Chandra that we come back with a full number data set and look at this again next month. I, I assume that's what he's proposing, uh, as well as Makita's proposing that we that we dollar cost average leg into it uh, over time, which would smooth out the suddenness of the transition. Um, I don't know if we we haven't done that with asset allocations before, so I don't know how that complicates our our life and and our voting in terms of uh, specifically uh, moving. This, slowly on that one asset or on all the assets under review in mix A. I'm not exactly sure what we would be voting for in terms of that. Um, uh, and I please. guess the third question is, is there a target duration for the investment grade bonds where we're going from short term where I presume the, the duration is maybe a year or less? Are we moving into an average duration of five years, 10 years, three years. I'm not sure what the target is for this new 14% allocation to investment grade bonds. 
So just a couple of comments. So previously the police and fire board has actually done this where they've approved an asset allocation and uh, allowed us to actually gradually implement this uh, both because of dollar cost averaging and because of market frothiness in general. And so we've been able to do that successfully in the past. And so that's something that we can do uh, if the board so wishes uh, us to do. And investment grade bonds specifically, uh, we usually, we follow the Barclays uh, Global Ag and we follow the duration there. So it's somewhere around, it's on average, it's, it's an intermediate bond index is how I would look at it. So we have a motion. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, Please. yeah, I would, I was, I, if the chair was going to recite where we are, that's what I was going to do um, just to get us centered. We have a, an original motion and second to move to mix A. We have a substitute motion without a second uh, by uh, Trustee Horowitz. And that's where we stand right now. Yes. Um, let's see, so I, I'm going to throw out the possibility of um, amending a motion or coming with a, another motion to adopt mix A and um, with the direction to staff um, to bring back a, um, um, a migration from uh, the current mix to mix A over the next um, three quarters. Can we amend the motion to do that? The, uh, if we recognize first that the substitute motion failed because of lack of a second, then we are now dealing with the initial, the original motion. Um, I would be happy to withdraw my alternative motion in favor of what uh, uh, Chairman Castiano just uh, suggested. Okay. Um, Trustee Orr, as the uh, maker of the original motion, uh, are you um, open to that amendment? Yes, I'm okay with uh, revising the motion to accept, let's see, proposal A with a transition period over, I believe you said three quarters uh, to be driven by staff and Nikita on the SAA target. Thank you. And um, Trustee Chandra, are you still good with the second? Uh, yes, I'm still good with the second. Okay, very good. Other uh, questions or comments before we vote? All right, let's do the roll call vote. Thank you everybody for the great um, input on that and brain power. Uh, <laughs> Vice Chair Horowitz. I vote aye. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. I vote aye. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. I vote aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you, I also vote aye. So that motion carries unanimously five to zero. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Polani, is there anything else under 3F? Uh, I think that concludes that Mr. Chairman and I'll be happy to actually come back and report to the board next month on how we're going to actually transition to uh, mix A over the course of the year, or the next three yeah. quarters. Very good, thank you very much. All right, we are. Uh, we just finished 3F and um, I was targeting for a break at 10 or 10.30, we're a little bit late, but let's, let's do five minutes. Um, I have 11.02, please be back at 11.07 and we will um, continue with the agenda.
Are we back and ready to go? Let's see. Okay, I can see um, Trusty Jennings. Trusty Horowitz is here, Vice Chair Horowitz, excuse me. Is Trusty Chandra back? Hi, it's Elaine, have... I'm back. Trusty Orr, thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Okay, all right, let's uh, jump back into the agenda. 3G, discussion and action on the city's pre-funding option for fiscal year 21-22. Mr. Polani, can I uh, have you open this one? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so to pre-fund or not to pre-fund, that is the question. Um, unfortunately, that is up to the city and not up to us, uh, but we do have some levers to mitigate risk, risks for the plans when it comes to pre-funding or not pre-funding. And to enlighten us on all those options, I'm gonna turn this over to Jake Kwan. Thank you, and uh, I'll, we'll try to keep this straightforward. <clears throat> I think all of the trustees actually were present for last year's uh, pre-funding decision. So hopefully this isn't too unfamiliar. I'll start with a little bit of background uh, to kind of bring everybody back to uh, back up to speed. So as trust, uh, CIO Polani noted, the sponsor, that is the city, has the option to determine the frequency of their contribution payments to the plan uh, with some reasonable parameters. And so the default assumption used to calculate the dollar amount of the contribution is a biweekly payment alongside the payroll calendar. So effectively the city pays alongside the employee's contribution. But the city does have the option to change that schedule. And in the past, they've pre-funded their contribution to the plan in a lump sum at the beginning of the year. Uh, they do this in part because they get a discount for paying up front. And so if, uh, if there are some budgetary concerns, then that discount can help. Uh, as it turns out, the size of the discount is determined by the board with the requirement that the, uh, the amount be actuarially equivalent to the default method of payment. But here, actuarial equivalence can vary by time horizon. So the board has some discretion as to what the discount should be. So just to kind of recap here, the sponsor, determines, the sponsor determines whether to pre-fund their contribution and the board determines what the discount is for that pre-funding. So uh, again, as the CIO noted, CIO noted a few years back, uh, staff recommended a policy to vary the discount based on economic and financial conditions. So it's, this was about uh, seven years ago now and the economy had been in a, a long expansion since the financial crisis, and um, folks were beginning to worry about overpriced markets. So the city at that point had also chosen to pre-fund for about six years running. And so what would happen is on July 1st, the start of the fiscal year, the plan would get a, uh, a couple hundred million dollars and have to absorb that into the asset allocation. The, the, the concern there is that when the city pre-funds their contribution, uh, the, the plan ends up bearing the risk that the return on those funds through the year doesn't meet the discount rate. And so in a, in a, in a market that was viewed to be expensive, that risk could have been elevated. Right? So the recommended policy remedied this risk or tried to uh, address this risk by adjusting the size of the pre-funding discount based on economic and financial conditions. So uh, if the economy had been expanding for a while or markets and or markets had uh, been rising uh, greatly, then the pre-funding discount shrinks. Uh, so in, in our current uh, circumstances with the uh, COVID crisis just um, maybe a year ago, uh, we're not really at the point yet where the discounts uh, were intended to start phasing in. Uh, and that leads us to recommend uh, giving the city the, the full discount rate. So there, there are three attachments uh, on the agenda. One is the original staff memo from 2014 outlining the methodology for adjusting the discount. The second is a memo from Fiduciary Council explaining how the, uh, the city's municipal code outlines, um, uh, again, uh, the, the rights of the different parties in this process. 
And the final memo is a staff recommendation for this year that the board continue following the existing methodology and extend the city the full discount. Uh, so this, this item was covered at the most recent investment committee meeting and the committee voted to, um, I, it's two trustees, but uh, unanimously to recommend that the full board give the city the full discount rate uh, for use in determining their pre-funding contribution. And just um, the way the math works, because the payments are normally made evenly. Uh, so every, uh, every other week throughout the year, the average maturity of those payments is about half a year. So uh, the effective discount rate used in calculating the pre-funding amount is, is, comes out to about half the annual assumed rate uh, here of, of six and five eighths. Um, so it's 3.3125. Uh, um, sorry for the math in the middle of uh, the explanation. That's that's the summary. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Uh, Mr. Kwan, anything else to add on that? Uh, nothing particular, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. All right. Um, any uh, questions, comments from uh, members of the board? If not, I entertain a motion. Um, to accept the staff recommendation to um, provide the city with a full discount rate for pre-funding. A motion to provide the city the full funding. Uh, thank you, Trustee Jennings. I second. Trustee Chandra, thank you for the second. Any other discussion by the board? I think that was Trustee Horowitz, but I would have seconded anyway. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. My apologies. I'm, I'm not sure our accents are quite the same, but <laughs> I'm a New obviously, to me, obviously. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the a motion by trustee Jennings and a second by trustee or vice chair Horowitz. Any other discussion by the board, by the public? Okay. Let's do the roll call vote. Uh, vice chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Chandra. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you, I also vote aye on that. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Pawnee, Mr. Kwan, uh, for that one. Uh, 3G, I'm sorry, 3H is approval to renew the following board contracts. Uh, Abel, Noser, Clarity FX, and Dynamo Software. Mr. Pawnee, or is that yes. uh, Mr. Kumar? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I hand this over to Mr. Kumar, just a couple of things. Uh, I do want to thank Makita and Veris for all the work that they did on strategic asset allocation. Uh, Makita came out with its uh, revised capital market assumptions at the end of January, and we had about three weeks to prepare for the IC. And so they put in a lot of hours. Um, there were probably days when Laura thought that the only client that she had was San Jose. So I really want to thank them for all the work that they did on that. Uh, and moving on to this particular item, we do need the board's approval for three contracts, Abel Moser, Clarity FX, and Dynamo. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Kumar. Uh, but just one comment, you may wonder why, as you can see, we're asking for three-year extensions for Abel, Noser, and Clarity, and two-year for Dynamo. And so you may question why this is not annual, but for three years, uh, we do actually get favor favorable economics by actually uh, extending it for three years. Um, but uh, we also have the option to uh, terminate any of these contracts with a month's notice. So we do get uh, favorable economics at the same time, uh, keeping flexibility. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Kumar. Thank you. Good morning, trustees. Uh... So we have three contracts, Clarity FX, Able Noja, and Dynamo. Clarity FX and Able Noja provide trading cost analysis uh, for our portfolios. And Dynamo, we use Dynamo for uh, manager contract trade, tracking, document storage, and due diligence workflow. And uh, as uh, Mr. Polani said, uh, we are requesting three years for, for the trading cost analysis contracts and Dynamo two years. Um, with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Mr. Kumar, uh, is Dynamo an existing vendor? Yes, it is. Uh, it's a software system that we procured back in 2016. And, and um, is there a reason that one is two years while the others are three years? 
Uh, normally, they they request one year uh, agreements. So I was able to uh, negotiate a two year term. Okay. They they would not uh, go any further than that. No. All right. It's interesting, but it seems like most would want the extended agreement, and so we work them down to the three years just for our due diligence. But this one, we're having a bump up yeah. to two. Okay, that's fine. Other um, uh, questions or comments from board members? Otherwise, um, I'll entertain a motion to um, renew these three agreements as recommended. I'll make a, uh, a motion to approve all three. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. Seconded. Thank you, Vice Chair Horowitz. Any other discussion by the board, by the public? Okay, the roll call vote, Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, um, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, I also vote aye, so that motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Kumar. Um, Moving on, item four, old business, there is none. Item five is new business. 5A is the oral update from the CEO of Retirement Services, Mr. Roberto Pena. Thank you, Chair Castellano. If you bear with me for a couple of minutes, I have a list of uh, issues to update the board on. One of which actually is a question I'm gonna to pose to uh, all of you for some uh, comments or direction. But let me start with, Letting you know that the uh, RFP for uh, board medical advisor was uh, issued last week and uh, the deadline for responses is April 14. So at your next meeting on the 15, we'll have an update um, as to how many um, applications we receive. Um, we are on the process of uh, setting up interviews for the senior benefit analysts and senior uh, and the benefit analyst positions uh, under the benefits area at the office. So we will keep you posted on that process. Um, I think, as you indicated this morning, uh, there was a large uh, list of uh, federated uh, members' retirement. That's because the cost of living adjustment is due to appear on their paycheck, uh, retirement benefit paycheck for the month of April. So I just wanted to let you all know that uh, staff have been working, uh, will be working diligently on making sure that the cost of living adjustment is included properly in the April paychecks. Um, that also means that uh, there are some retirees that are impacted by the Intenia Revenue Code 415 bill limits. Uh, which uh, means that um, those amounts, uh, those benefits will have to, uh, some of them will have to be adjusted and they will be receiving our annual letter explaining uh, the rationale and the calculation behind the adjustment. Uh, the retir retirement uh, connection newsletter uh, should be issued sometime uh, mid-April. So uh, you should have a copy of the newsletter by your meeting on April 15. Uh, the office will be closed on, on March, uh, Wednesday, 31st, in observance of uh, Cesar Chavez days. Uh, this morning, um, during consent, you actually approve uh, fiduciary insurance uh, on the, the consent agenda. And the reason uh, it wasn't a discussion item is because some time back, your board adopted a policy that whenever there was either a decrease or an increase less than 5% from the prior year, it could go on consent. The increase was about three year, 3% 3 from prior year. So that's why we put it on consent. Just so that you understand, you actually approve three separate agreements. Uh, they are for a regular fiduciary insurance. Uh, and if you bear with me, I, I have staff uh, text me that information. You also approve the excess liability and you also approve what is also known as a side A. And what a side A does, it ensures that the first dollar of coverage kicks in right away so the trustee does not have to pay. Uh, because you did approve three agreements, um, uh, there is a requirement, as uh, many of you know this from uh, prior years, uh, each one of you paid $25. And so because there are three agreements, the total amount is 75. That is uh, due by the end of the month. 
we will follow up with an email to all of you to let you know um, where you can send that payment to uh, so you can mail it to the office. Uh, if you haven't already, I want to remind you that the Form 700 filing due date is, is coming up. It's April 1st. If you did file already, thank you. If you haven't, again, the deadline is uh, April 1st. You should have received emails from the city clerk. If you have any questions about the process of filing the Form 700, please let us know. We will either try to answer the questions for you or we will get you in touch with general counsel so they can help you. Um, I also wanted to let you know uh, this morning on consent, we included a very short presentation that uh, was made to the city council last Tuesday on the results of the actual evaluation. Um, I have been working over the years to decrease the presentation. The first year, I think it was like 20 slides. It's finally down to five slides. And I think I key in on the, on the on the important issues uh, that, that are of relevance to the city council in terms of fund status, of fund liability, city contributions, and, and projected contributions for the next 10, 20 years. I thought it was uh, well received and we, asked, uh, we were asked some good questions. Uh, one of which was, of course, if there's any way that staff and your board can keep up producing those double digit returns to which I responded by Absolutely no problem, we will do that. Uh, we may meet sometimes, but we will try our hardest. Um, I just want to let you know that as staff, as always, I like to do this publicly. I want to give them kudos for their commitment and engagement. We continue working remotely. It's been a year, it was actually a year to the day yesterday that we went remotely. Uh, we are completing on our core duties and that, that is a, uh, not, uh, not only in our office, but the city is because of the engagement and commitment for the staff who actually get the work done and, and actually take care of our members. So kudos to the staff and on behalf of the members and your boards, I want to publicly thank you the staff for continuing doing so. And the last item uh, that I wanted to mention, uh, which I will uh, ask uh, respectfully if you have some comments or direction, as you know, Trustee Son left him employment with the city, uh, which then left uh, an open seat on your board. Her term was actually uh, coming up November 21st. The, uh, the city clerk did start some process for the election, but I was uh, earlier this week uh, on this uh, today in the communications with the city staff um, uh, because that election, if it takes place now, and, and you know they elect a member and is appointed by the city council is only good through November 21st, which at which time they will have to produce a second election for the new four year term. So um, I was hoping that you board uh, would allow me some flexibility uh, on, on manage this process with the city to make it as, as efficient as possible. One of the possibilities is for the city to reach out to the to the membership to see if they have someone that could be appointed by the city council uh, without an election, and that will be. And I know Cheryl is, I believe, is is, is attending the meeting and is listening. So Cheryl, by all means, if I misspeak here, correct me. If they are appointed by the city council, they could be appointed through November 2021, uh, at which time then. Uh, the city clerk could then uh, perform the regular election process so that uh, a member is elected for the four-year term. I'm just trying to limit uh, the work by the city clerk having to perform two separate elections and also by trying to fill the seat as quickly as possible. So uh, ideally, this issue would have been agendized on the board agenda and uh, you would have made a motion. Uh, but again, what I'm looking for First of all, obviously, if you have any comments or questions, to please share them with me. But uh, I was hoping that you uh, allow me and give me the flexibility to work with the city for the most eff effective and efficient way to first fill the seat uh, through the current term that ends on November 20, uh, 21st, and second, then uh, to have the, uh, the election for the next four-year term from uh, 21 to 2025. And that concludes uh, my comments, Mr. Chair.
Thank you. Um, Ms. Parkman, did you want to have any comments on that? No, we're Thanks for joining us, by the way. Oh, oh, sure. Happy to be here. Here, happy to see everyone <laughs> on YouTube. Um, I, Roberto had it exactly right. The Muni Code does allow for someone to be appointed uh, for the uh, rest of the term until the expiration date. So, what we would do is, you know, we have reached out to the unions and the, uh, the bargaining units uh, regarding this. We would just reach back out to them and tell them if this is what the board decides uh, that we're we're going to be going about it this way, so that we do have that collaboration. That's the only thing that I wanted to add in. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Pena, so you're looking for reactions from the board about um, well, allowing you the flexibility, but the managing our expectation, the seat might not be filled right away. Um, unfortunately, yeah. we did make a, this year's committee assignments um, with um, Trustee Sun's um, uh, resignation in mind. Mm -hmm. So the slots are filled and covered uh, for now. Um, any reactions for uh, Mr. Pena? Um, Trustee Jennings. Yeah. So, uh, you would reach out to, uh, so is this something that uh, OER would initiate through reaching out, uh, Cheryl, I thought it heard you say, to the unions or other uh, people to see if someone would be interested in, and then we would, it, it would just be appointed? I mean, do we vote on that? Does it? Uh, just go forward. I, I, I guess I don't understand the mechanics a little. But that's a good question, Trustee Jennings. So what would happen is that I think that we would definitely reach out to the unions to see if there was anybody that was interested in being on the board for this appointed term. Uh, just because someone is appointed to this term does not mean that they can then yeah, you know, or they wouldn't be eligible to then be elected in the next period. So if that would be something that we would state. Uh, this is not a board uh, appointment. This is a city council appointment. So once that person was determined or identified, we would take it to city council for approval through that process. All right, um, good. Uh, I do think just because I am the only city employee here, <laughs> so um, I think there is someone who is interested in it um, since I also I'm on a union and um, and that conversation has been had um, so Cheryl you could uh, reach out to Matt Mason because there is someone I think uh, I don't know if it's appropriate to say anything more than that at this point so probably I, I won't um, but um, uh, that person has reached out, uh, reached out to me just to understand what the role is, reached out to Matt to talk a little more about it, um, and the person has an interest. So <laughs> I've reached out to some people I know in the city just to see if they're interested, um, but I haven't had anyone really jump on it aside from this one person at this point. Absolutely, I'd be more than happy to reach out to uh, uh, who Trustee Jennings is referring to as the business agent for the three uh, unions under IFPTE, and I would be more than happy to reach out to, to Mr. Mason in order to determine uh, that person's interest. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Cheryl. Uh, just, just so that we are clear, um, uh, absent of any uh, direction or, or anything like that, then the city clerk will then go ahead with an election just now that will take us possibly to the end of the fiscal year, uh, but that only would be good through November 21st. So then they will have to run another election in the fall. So that's, I'm trying to avoid that as well. And lastly, I do wanna mention that there was one of requirement that because Trustee Jennings is from a particular department, uh, Parks and Rec at the city, uh, whoever um, is either appointed or elected to become a trustee of your board cannot be from the same department. So it will have to be from an, another department throughout the city. And so this person I, is. So with that, again, uh, if there are no comments, I think uh, I would take that as a okay to go ahead and work to, with the city to make it the most effective and efficient way and try to get someone on board as quickly as possible unless you have any specific requirements that you would like me not to pursue or to do. 
I'm fine with what you described, Mr. Pena. Anyone else have any reactions? I would just make this observation. I, I think there's uh, could be potentially a big learning curve. So the appointment of essentially a, a temporary trustee that is likely to be replaced is probably a suboptimal solution. So uh, you didn't mention it as a possibility, the possibility of of having an election for a full four year term, I take it is off the table. So that is I, you, your point is well taken. Um, the election will have to happen either way, uh, but uh, uh, I think the, um, the hope is that, um, in, well, first of all, let me just say Trustee Horowitz that, and Trustee Jennings can confirm this. There are not that many members of the city that are jumping at the chance to be a trustee of the board. Uh, in fact, we had a you tough time. About free lunch. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, and even that went away uh, when we started working the moment. But uh, what I was going to say is that the, the real hope here is you are correct, Trustee Horowitz, is that if someone comes forward to fill the position and to be appointed by the city council, that the member uh will be willing to then run uh for the election for the new four year and, and, and hopefully they will be elected as well but, but your point is well taken you are correct yes and just to say a little bit more trustee horowitz because i did reach out i reached out to someone who had workers comp background you know thinking that person would be really good i know we're interested in having a bit more of that and um i know this person and uh but it was yeah, something they didn't want to do or take on. Um, I have reached out to another person who I know is very bright and capable, has a little bit of real estate, you know, minimal. But um, again, I haven't heard back. Uh, so I have tried to reach, I reached out to finance people who actually have investment background and one person just didn't think they had the ability to do it and another didn't even reply. So, um, I know a lot of people have been around uh, a bit. So uh, the person who is interested uh, does have, is a, seems to be savvy, um, kind of a policy analyst type um, role uh, of sorts. So um, again, no one really has investing background unless you're actually in finance and even, you know, the trustee that left, you know, was only short term investment, right? So it's hard to find someone uh, exactly who fits the bill. Uh, so it needs to be someone who really wants it or interested to do it or hopefully has some educational background. So this person is interested, this person actually reached out. So uh, that, um, again, I don't want to throw names out there until Cheryl uh, goes through that piece of it. I think that's only appropriate. But, um, I didn't, I, I think the person has interest in probably the ability to participate. It's a steep learning curve. Okay. For what it's worth. <laughs> Anything, any other follow-up for uh, Mr. Pena on 5A? Okay, let's go to 5B, oral update from the City Council Liaison to the Board. Councilmember Davis, good morning. Good morning. Um, so my report is about the, the five-year forecast that, that the Budget Office came out with. And um, the base case was a $48.1 million shortfall in the upcoming 21-22 fiscal year. The op the optimistic case still has a shortfall of about $14 million, and the pessimistic case is a shortfall of $78 million. And so in the mayor's March budget message, which we passed on Tuesday, he called for putting um, about $80 million of the $200 million of um, relief funds that we are projected to get from the federal government into a reserve for um, future years, and also as a as a hedge against that uh, that pessimistic case. So, and I, I do want to be really clear when the um, and I'm sure you all know this, but it's just a re just a reminder. And because this is a public meeting, I like to do this education. 
when the budget office comes out with their forecast, those are all, the forecasts are all based on ongoing expenses and ongoing revenue. So it doesn't include what we're, um, our pandemic response, which is all funded through one-time money and is considered not an ongoing expense, but may need to be continuing through multiple years. And so the, the mayor tried to take the, that into account as well with, with the March budget message and, and the stimulus. So we can't use the stimulus to just backfill our entire deficit because we still have additional, um, additional activities that we are funding as part of the pandemic response and recovery as well. The city council also took action on a recovery roadmap in the last few weeks, including on um, on Monday and Tuesday are kind of put the finishing touches on that. So the recovery roadmap is a work plan for the entire city staff, including all, all departments about how we will continue, which activities we will continue um, through kind of through the next fiscal year, at least, um, in terms of not only pandemic response, but anticipating a recovery and what might be needed for that recovery for both our residents and our businesses. And that is the end of my report. Thank you very much, Council Member Davis. Yeah, fascinating times for, in terms of policy making. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's go on to item 5C, discussion and action on the Office of Retirement Services proposed administrative budget for fiscal year 21-22. Is that Mr. Pena or uh, Ms. Foy? I'm sorry, I was uh, mute, uh, Chair. Yes, uh, you uh, indicated the budget. So good morning, everyone. So um, we presented the uh, proposed uh, annual administrative budget to the police and fire at the meeting early this month. And now we are here before you to present the proposed budget for the federated uh, retirement system. Um, so just a little bit of a, well, let's just go to slide two for a quick second. Um, you do have three uh, documents um, on, in the agenda. If we can go to slide two, Linda. So the budget at a glance, uh, that's what's included in the budget. There are three documents. Uh, one, the first one is uh, the memorandum explaining the budget process. You may recall a, a few years back, the, the city auditor recommended that uh, the budget process uh, uh, was uh, revised. Uh, and I think rightfully so, so that um, uh, the information that we provide to the to both boards is the same information that is not only shared with the city uh, budget office, but also is the same information that actually makes its way to the city council, who ultimately approve your uh, the the requested budget uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, what you have in the memo and the second document is just a, a detailed explanation of a uh, expense breakdown. It explained what the sources of funds are uh, and the uses of funds. And then uh, it also touched a little bit on uh, the rest of the administrative budget. The third document is this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, which actually uh, addresses the, the, the request that we are gonna be proposing to you this morning, uh, providing this, the specific information on the four main areas that we concentrate, which are personnel costs, equipment, professional services, and medical services. And then we, we close the presentation with a very short analysis and comparison of um, uh, our costs from a standpoint of administrative budget that we're proposing with other plans throughout the state. So with that, we can go to the next slide, uh, Linda, please. Again, I, uh, the sources of funds is a combination of the city contributions, uh, the participant contributions, and then the investment income, which is really nothing more than the expected average asset balance throughout the fiscal year times the assumed rate return 
which you may recall was recently reduced by your board during the actual evaluation. The new assumed period of return is 6.6 to 5 or 6 and 5 8. So, based on that information, we have a projected investment income. Uh, and then the uses of funds, uh, obviously, the, the biggest use is, is the benefits and health insurance that we pay out throughout the year. And then, to some extent, obviously, the administrative expense, which is um, the budget that we are proposing to you this morning. If we can go to the next slide. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the presentation this morning is comprised of four main uh, areas. Uh, the biggest one is personal services. And I wanted to remind you that what we do is, I think this is, this is an issue that has been raised in the past uh, in other presentations. We do not keep track of, an, we don't have an actual track of how much time staff actually spend on their work related to either police and fire members or federal members. Uh, ideally, that would be the best case scenario. And then we could split the personal services exactly based on the data. We think that having a 50-50 approach is, is just as reasonable to do. Uh, the, the only caveat that I want to mention here is that uh, sometime back it was agreed that the personal costs related to the investment staff will be split instead of 50-50 at a 40-60% mean, which is really based on the asset side uh, for both plans together. Uh, the equipment uh, cost is, is the administrative overhead costs, uh, and that includes mostly rent, supplies, equipment, but it doesn't include professional services. The professional services, uh, these are investment professional, investment professional services are not included here. Uh, again, that's not part of the administrative budget, but it does include legal, actuarial, and other consulting services. And then lastly, uh, the medical services that is usually provided by your medical advisor uh, during the disability process. So with that, we can jump into the actual presentation for the next slide. Um, these are the sources of funds uh, The you know, again, I mentioned uh, what that, uh, how we arrived at those numbers. Uh, if we can, you know, I'm happy to answer any question, but if we can skip the sources and uses of funds in that and go to the actual slide presentation, I think it's number seven on the, actual budget uh, proposal. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, the total uh, proposal is $5.3 million. You can see that the bulk of that is on personal services, is $3.68 million. Um, the total request of 5.3 million is uh, about 6% higher than what was actually proposed and adopted by you board at last year uh, presentation of shy of five million dollars. Uh, personnel is actually an increase of about nine and uh, three quarters of a percent. Um, and if we can, uh, and then uh, personal equipment is actually a request for seven hundred twenty-four thousand. That's about an eight percent decrease from the prior year. And professional services uh, eight point four percent higher than eight hundred fifteen thousand. And medical services. The proposed amount is 80,000, which is 20% decrease. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of these particular expenses and we provide some uh, detailed information. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, Linda. Thank you. So uh, as I go through the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me. But um, in a nutshell here, the increase of about nine and three quarters is actually due to the fact that uh, the uh, authorized positions for the office went up, or we are proposing that it goes up from 38 and three quarters to 40. So that's an increase of one and one quarter of a position. And let me explain to you how that works. The one full position that we added, you may recall that in last December, uh, we work uh, with the city and through the mayor's office to actually implement uh, the two promotions uh, and investment staff area, which actually created a new senior investment officer position. Uh, and so that one position of senior investment officer is the additional uh, full-time position that we're adding. In addition, the, the one quarter 
position that we are in is we do have an employee uh, that is actually retiring uh, this month. He has worked with us for quite a few years. Initially, it was a full permanent position uh, because of some specific um, requirements. Uh, we adjusted the position from 100% to 75 percentile. Uh, there were some uh, uh, requests to accommodate uh, for some issues, uh, some physical limitations that, that he was dealing with. And so we accommodated the request to continue working with, uh, with the staff. As he is retiring this year, we are then proposing to uh, bring the position back from the original uh, 100 percentile that was eventually decreased to 75 percentile to another 100 percentile so that we can hopefully uh, pursue filling that position in the new year. If we can go to the next slide, uh, Linda. So this is just in a nutshell the uh, the org chart. Uh, so I'm going to cut your attention to the two the two gray areas here on the left hand side is the senior investment officer position. When the when the promotion was provided, we went through an overstrength position. We are now making that a permanent position, which is why for the new fiscal year it's an additional one hundred percent position. And then towards the middle, you see the other gray is a staff specialty. Uh, we are um, proposing a hundred percentile for that position rather than a 75 percent part-time position as, as the member is now retiring and then the other uh, four positions uh, which uh, you have to excuse me I'm a little colorblind but I think they're either light blue or green I'm not sure those are the positions that at this point are vacant at the office we have an investment analyst position that is vacant we have a staff specialist that is vacant and then we have the two analyst positions that I mentioned in my other report that we are going to hopefully be interviewing later this month the senior analyst and a benefit analyst under the benefits function if we can go to the next slide uh, linda so the next uh, uh, bucket in the proposed budget is the non-personnel equipment analysis so uh, let me just get right to the point here um, you're going to see this towards the end of the presentation when we compare our administrative budget request with our peers uh, across the state. Um, um, it is, is, it is uh, a known fact that our peers throughout the state, when they uh, put forward their administrative budget request, they, didn't, they do not include any investment-related expense. Investments is usually, per government code, just subtracted directly from the earnings on the investment uh, function. They're not really part of the uh, of the administrative budget, and so we have been slowly but surely every year stripping out some of those investment related expenses. And this was the last year. Last year, we actually included in the proposed budget investment analytics and research budget of about four hundred and thirty five thousand dollars that is not included in this year budget so that we can be more a par with not only what we believe is the appropriate definition of the administrative budget, but also to be a par with our peers throughout the state. Um, that said, um, I have elected to continue uh, including the investment personnel cost in our administrative budget. And the reason for that is, is because when we do go to the city council, that is a big portion of the budget that they approve and, and, and stripping out the investment staff portion of the uh, personal costs um, will just cause more discussion and explanation at the city council level. So I have elected to leave it here, but you should know that in many of our peers, they either don't have the investment function that we do, or if they do, they actually do not include the investment related costs including personnel but in any case the main reason for the decrease in here is the four hundred thirty five thousand dollars that was removed from last year budget we also reduced obviously postage and printing and supplies and of course travel travel budget was uh reduced by twenty thousand because we are not traveling uh, as much anymore so if we can go to the next uh, slide uh, linda 
So in a nutshell, the $724,000 is comprised of, of those seven items. Uh, I'm gonna call your attention to the two biggest ones. Uh, one of them was rent, which as you know, we pay on them on a uh, monthly basis, even though uh, you know most we're not really working from our offices these days. And then of course, you just approved uh, fiduciary insurance, uh, and this also includes commercial liability insurance, a total of that is 213,000, but in a nutshell, those two expenses is more than 50% of your total uh, uh, non-personnel equipment analysis. If we can go to the uh, next slide, uh, Linda, please. Uh, so the next item uh, is professional services analysis. Uh, this is 815,000. Uh, the main reason for the 8.4 percent increase here, and we will uh, we will show uh, what's the composition of the 815,000 that we are requesting, is because every five years we do perform an actuarial audit, and so last year budget or the last four years did not include expenses related to the actuarial audit. Uh, you actually, at your last meeting, approved uh, not only the extension of Chiron uh, to provide actuarial services, but you also approved uh, an agreement with SIGA for actuarial audit services. So that amount of 100,000 is included in this budget. If we did not have the audit, then that proposed amount would be 715,000, which would be lower than what was adopted in last year audit and last year budget. Um, it, it does also include a reduction in the legal services and the temporary staffing services, uh, $17,000. So, uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, Linda. Roberto, on that one, yes, uh, the on the audit. So that's that's an ongoing expense that we had not have budgeted in the past. That that's just an expense every five years. So last uh -oh. time that we included that was in the budget was five years ago. We I'm are including it again in this budget because it's for the evaluation as of twenty twenty one. So you have to be paid in the twenty one twenty two budget year. Okay, so every five years it'll come back to us. That is that is correct. I apologize if I wasn't clear enough on that. Linda, I apologize. If you can go back one slide, I wanted to show what is the composition of the 815,000. Roberto, that slide is blank. Well, um, if you could imagine that slide, um, <coughs> Benji, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pinch it in here. I can share and my screen if you'd like. Could you please? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it, this because the slide does show on online. So uh, yeah, we know. I know. I know it exists. So thank you, Benji. If you can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Benji. So, um, uh, so the annual valuation again. The first and the largest uh, amount is two hundred and twenty thousand almost. Uh, that's for actuarial services. Legal, which is really the bulk of those, are you uh, fiduciary and general counsel, but we also include in there tax counsel, investment counsel, and you disability counsel. We are proposing 257000 And then the, uh, the actual audit of $100,000, again, that's an expense that is included uh, every five years. Then the rest of them, you know, the regular audit, hopefully you will be approving that later this morning of 83000 and so on and so forth. So the combination of all those uh, items adds to 815,000. Again, I'm happy to, to answer any specific questions, but if there are none, uh, I will ask uh, um, Benji to go to the next slide on the medical services. So as I mentioned before, uh, medical services uh, is a decrease of about 20%. Um, uh, the work uh, provided and the services to be provided by the uh, medical board advisor. As I mentioned this morning, we just issued the RFP last week and we're hoping uh, by sometime next month, um, we have some new uh, applications and hopefully we can come forward with a new contract uh, for you to approve for the new fiscal year. But at this point, we anticipating based on the experience that we have had with the federated 
disabilities of $80,000 for the fiscal year 21-22. Um, so that in a nutshell is the, the presentation on the proposal for the $5.3 million. The last couple of slides, what we like to do is just to provide you some data points uh, from a reasonable standpoint, just to make sure that uh, I believe you will, I will hope that you will agree with us that our request is certainly reasonable uh, in comparison with other uh, systems across the uh, across the uh, the state. So the first one that we have is we compare ourselves in terms of personal services in basis point with our peers. There's two things I want to mention in here. The first one is what I indicated is that. Um, we do elect to include the personnel cost for the investment staff. That is not the case, I wouldn't say in all cases, but if it's not in all cases, most of our peers do not include any in-house investment staff expenses in the personnel. That's the first one. The second one that I want to, to uh, caution you here is you can see the Federated City, um, the actual, and again, this is information based on last year budget because that's the most recent numbers that we have to compare with other peers and their CAFA information is 13 basis points. Uh, you uh, uh, plan size is, it goes in the bucket of zero to $5 billion. So when you first look at 13 basis point versus nine, you think, gee, we are considering more expensive. But I, I just want to caution you two things. The first one, as I already mentioned, is the investment staff personal cost. But the second one is the fact that you have a lower uh, asset base than police and fire. And, and that's impacting the calculation. If you look at police and fire, who also is a plan that is in the zero to five billion, they are right on, um, on the money with the nine basis point. That's because their asset base is higher. So the total cost divided by the higher asset base will produce a lower basis point. When you combine both plans, again, I think it's more realistic of 11 basis points. And again, I will caution you again with the statement that I made in terms of including investment staff, personal costs. And obviously, personal costs and benefits here, this is the Bay Area. Um, we as well as uh, the other systems in the Bay Area are going to show a relatively higher basis point here than other systems throughout the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the state, especially the ones from my former uh, systems in the Central Valley, because you know, we have a higher uh, um, um, compensation uh, base here. So that's going to show up in the basis point. But in a nutshell, hopefully what you can get out of this information is that I think it, it, when it's all considered, uh, the, the request from the personal standpoint is actually reasonable compared to our peers. Uh, the next slide, uh, Benji, is the same information, but in, in, uh, instead of a basis point, it's actually dollars. And so, um, again, uh, this is just the same information, 3.3 uh, million compared to um, all the public pension plans in the asset base of zero to five billion of 2.6. Uh, again, um, if you will street out the investment staff personnel costs, uh, I, I would say that we are most likely will be in that same range of about $2.6 million. So again, I keep going back to that, but that's just, again, it's something that I have elected to keep in the budget, but it's not something that uh, our peers, uh, including fact, you may recall that uh, the former senior investment officer, who is now the CIO for the Kern County Retirement Assistant, one of the 37 assistants, I asked him, uh, hey, does your cost uh, for personnel included in the, in the annual administrative budget for Kern County? He said, no, his, 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 his salary and benefits cost is not included in the annual uh, administrative budget prepared by the Kern County system. So just, just, just as an example. Uh, now we do have the same information uh, instead of just the personal services is for the total administrative cost of request. Uh, so that's what you see here. Again, we have one slide in basis points and one slide is in dollar figures, uh, federated 22 basis point. Uh, I think again, a, a, a more telling here is instead of dividing either federated and police, again, the main difference in 22 versus 15 basis point there is because your asset base is lower than police and fire. I think 17 basis point for the combined 
office is uh, more realistic. The truth is that you are, uh, the combination of both of you are in the range of 5 billion to 10 billion. Uh, and so you have to compare the 70 basis point to 14 basis points. And then the next, uh, the next uh, slide is the same information, but uh, in dollar figures. So again, um, the combined San Jose is 11.1. The average for the public class is 11.8, so we are below that. But if you want to compare yourself to those plans in the same range in terms of asset size of 5 to 10, when you combine both plans, we are right on the money of 10.7 uh, 10 million versus 11.1. And again, uh, this does include the investment staff uh, um, salaries and benefits. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but this, uh, you know, this conclude the, uh, the presentation and, and the hope here is that, uh, we have provided you enough, uh, food for thought and enough information and, and for you to, uh, approve the, uh, proposed, uh, administrative budget for federated for the upcoming fiscal year of $5.3 million. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you very much, Roberto. Um, I appreciate, um, the um, comparative information at the end of that presentation to give us a, some assurance about the reasonableness of the request. Um, and also just uh, to confirm too, we would be approving a budget that then has to go into the city's budget process because um, this, this would go into the May 1 proposed budget, right? Th that, that is correct. The so council all, all, would then approve. All the information that you've received this morning, especially the memo and the other um, documents, we we then take this information. Um, I believe Benji, correct me if I'm mistaken. We combine uh, the federated and police and fire and send it to the budget office. Is that correct? That is correct. Both yes. both plans are combined. Okay, yeah, very good. All right. Uh, questions, comments for Mr. Pena. If not. I'll entertain a motion in a second to um, approve the proposed budget um, as presented to us. I motion to approve the budget. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. Uh, Trustee Chandra, second. Okay, Trustee Chandra, thank you for that second. Um, any other discussion uh, by the board or by the public? All right, let's do the roll call vote. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Chandra. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you. And I also vote aye. So that motion carries unanimously five to zero. Thank, thank you, you very much for that. Yes, thank you. 5D is discussion and action on exercising the first of two one-year options for fiscal year ending June 30th, 21 with Grant Thornton LLP for audit services. Yes, so I, I will turn it over to, to Benji uh, for the discussion and presentation. She she drafted the memo, but I, I, I and I want to thank uh, um, Chair Castellano. Um, I probably, pro uh, partly my fault, mm -hmm. we were supposed to properly mm -hmm. know in the agenda, the description of what we were requesting. I think if you look at the memo, the memo is pretty clear that we, we will be asking you board to approve for the next two years as opposed to uh, just a one year approval. Um, and so I just wanted to make that, that point clear. But with that, um, I'll turn it over to Benji for uh, the presentation. Benji? Yes, I would like to apologize for that confusion. Um, I did not catch the agenda language that it said one year only. So um, Grant Thornton has performed external financial audits for the last five years for their contracts. The contract also includes two one-year options that we would like the board to exercise. We are happy with their services and their staffing, and the terms of the options are stated in the contract, including the amendments. For the fiscal year 21 audit, the cost would be approximately 82,000, and for the following year, it would be 84,000. Um, in addition to exercising the options, we will need to amend the contract to add $30,000 to cover the cost. Um, a couple of years ago, when the city um, decided to not use Grant Thornton, uh, Grant Thornton came to the boards to ask for um, additional funds to cover the, the additional cost that they would incur as a result of having separate auditors. Um, that is included in this 
um, request already in the 83,000 and 84,000 for fiscal year 21 and 22. So um, if, with that, um, are there any questions? Any questions by uh, uh, board members? If not, I'll entertain a motion in a second to approve exercising both two one-year extension options for audit services with Grant Thornton. So moved. Okay. I second. Uh, Vice Chair Horowitz for the motion and Trustee Jennings with a second. Thank you both. Um, any other discussion by the board? Uh, Mr. Chair, just one comment. I want to, this is an issue that came up at the police and fire. It was raised by uh, council member, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> general council uh, Harvey Lederman. And I wanted to uh, let everyone know, um, uh, auditing firms, accounting firms, they have a, a control, internal control where they, they like to switch partners on the audit engagement on a five-year uh, basis. And so they, they have been doing the work for our office five years. So we will be contacting Grant Thornton to find out uh, whether they will be staying with the same partner or they will be changing partners. So mm. once we find out that information, we certainly share that with, uh, with the board, but that doesn't change the recommendation from this morning. So thank you. Thank you much for the, uh, for the motion. Okay, good. good to know. All right, any other discussion by the board, by public? All right, let's do the roll call vote for this one. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you, I also vote aye. That motion carries unanimously 5-0. Thank you everyone for that, Mr. Pena, Ms. Foy. Um, moving on to item 5E. Uh, I am uh, going to recuse myself from this item um, because of my involvement with a uh, lawsuit that is not directly involved, but I want to stay away from anything um, near this topic. So um, I'm going to, um, uh, Vice Chair Horowitz, I'm not sure you saw my text um, alerting you to this, but. Um, no, I did not. <laughs> okay, so sorry about that. No uh, Mr. Pena, yeah, Mr. Pena knows. I'm going to go ahead and log off of um, Zoom now, and then Mr. Pena, could you um, text me when it's the right time to come back? We will definitely do that. Thank you, uh, Chair Castellano. Thank you. Okay. Um, who, who is going to present on this item? Yeah, Trustee Horowitz. So uh, Barbara Heyman, uh, our Deputy Director, uh, will be presenting uh, on this item. Uh, in a nutshell, this is, you know what, I'll let, uh, uh, I'll let Ms. Heyman explain um, the reason for the request and speak to the resolution. So with that, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director. Uh, this resolution is setting the COLA rate for 415B qualified participants. Uh, this is done annually. Uh, a member who joined the system prior to January 1st, 1990 is considered a qualified participant under the IRC 415B. Uh, so for those retirees who have a 415B, 415B impact, uh, who entered the plan before January 1st, 1990, they have the ability um, not to get a benefit lower than what would have been calculated under the rules as of um, October 14th, 1987. So uh, back in 1987, the COLA rules were different than they are today. Uh, COLA was set by the board annually and was based on the CPI December over December uh, for the prior year. So since the uh, 2020 December over December CPI rate was 2%, the COLA rate being declared in this resolution is 2%. And I can take questions from the board. Are there any questions from the board? None from me. Uh, can you remind us what is the COLA for the for the pension members as a whole? Depends. Uh, tier one guest 
uh, 3%. But that's by statute, yes. Yes. Barbara, Is I'm a little question? confused. Oh, okay. Um, can you just help me understand again exactly what this is this a tier two B or A or no, is no, this? this is for okay. So there are some members, as I say, um, mm -hmm. you're a tier one and you were a, a member of the plan prior to January 1st, 1990. Mm -hmm. You, mm -hmm. your benefit is, is grandfathered, so you can't get less of a benefit. Um, so your benefit can't be lower than what would have been calculated under the rules um, as of October 14th, 1987. So what we do is uh, for those 415 impacted members, you're grandfathered, we calculate their benefit um, within the, the 415 rules. So there's a cap. Um, then we compare it with what their benefit would have been had uh, had it been calculated under the rules um, as of like October 14th, 1987. And then um, they are able to get the higher of that benefit. So because the COLA at that time was based on uh, CPI and it would have been declared by the board um, via resolution like this one in front of you today. Um, that's why this um, resolution is here. It's, it's to set that COLA. So as when we're comparing the two benefits, like what the benefit is today versus what it would have been had it been calculated um, as of the rules of 1987, which one's higher. So they are able to get the higher benefit. So 1987, all right, so this is a tier one employee. It would be, yes. Would have been, right. And yeah. it, but back in 1987, were they getting 3% or not? The was that before the 3%? The maximum was 3%. Um, so it would have been maxed out at 3%. And um, if, the CPI was greater than 3%. There was this banking mechanism whereby the excess over and above 3% would have been put into a bank. So for years when perhaps the CPI was lower than 3%, mm. for example, two, you would have been able to draw on your bank to bring it up to a maximum of three. Really? Yes. And that was per individual? Or uh, that was the plan doing this? So um, let me address that, uh, uh, Barbara. So uh, Trustee Jennings, first of all, this is an issue that only impact a handful of members. Half. And these are members that are impacted by the Intenia Revenue Code 415B limit. Mm -hmm. On top of that, not only are they impacted by the 415B limit, but they have to have actually started working at the city back in 87. Back in 87, the benefit structure was different. For example, mm -hmm. it was a three year final average salary versus one. Mm -hmm. The CPI mm -hmm. was not fixed 3%. The CPI as explained by Ms. Heyman was up to 3% based on the actual calculation of the CPI for the San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose area. And what she was trying to explain was that in cases where um, it was this, it calculated that the that the CPI was high in three percent, that that delta was put in the bank so that in years that members are entitled to something lower than three percent, you can increase their benefit off to the maximum three percent, assuming there was some uh, delta on that bank, and yeah. that bank is based on the year that you retire, right? And so all she's trying to say here, what we're asking the board to do is to approve this resolution so that for those members that are impacted by the 415 bill limit and mm -hmm. also were lucky enough to start working with the city back in, in 87, where they we have the responsibility to compare the 415 bill limit benefit 
limited mm-hmm. by 415 based on the 3% fixed COLA and the one year financial salary benefit vis-a-vis what would have been their benefit given the three-year final salary, given the CPI based on actual CPI. And so we compare the two benefits. And if one, if the 415B limit benefit is 225,000 and the other calculation will give them 227,000, then we require this year to give them the highest of the two. That's why it's so critical that you board approve this resolution so we can do the calculations back uh, back in uh, when the CPI uh, mm-hmm. was not a, C, a 3% fix, but based on actual CPI for the San Jose, San Francisco, and Oakland area. So okay, it really so impacted it very limited agreement. number of people. It honors that agreement, but it goes over the, does it impact anything with the IRS ruling or not? This Would is, we this be is giving this, them more? We will give them more because it's allowed by the IRS and council, feel free to jump in here. Um, because they, they have that uh, uh, that ability to either compare the 415 bill limit uh-huh. versus the the what is called TAMRA. I, I, it escaped me what TAMRA stands for, but That's it's okay. tax and yeah. something. Uh, and so they are allowed to. We are required as a as an office to prepare both calculations mm-hmm. and afford to then the one on any given year that gives them the highest of the two. Interesting. So it's allowed. So yes. we are to say yes or no, basically. Yes. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Any other questions from trustees? So I will, uh, uh, Trustee Chandra? No, sorry, nothing. I was just okay. waiting to. I'm picking up uh, the background noises. So I will entertain a motion to accept a staff recommendation. I will make such a motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion by trustees? Any comment from the public? If not, we'll have a roll call vote. Trustee Tranja? Aye. Uh, Trustee Jennings? Aye. Trustee Orr? Aye. And I will also vote aye. And so the motion carries four to zero. And we can move to the next item. Yes, and and Trustee Horowitz, I just texted uh, Chair Castellano, he gave me the uh, all sign and he should be coming right back into your meeting. Good, good. <laughs> all right. Okay, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Horowitz, for taking that one. All right, let's go back onto the agenda. We're ready right now, uh, Roberto, for um, item yes. six. Okay, so six is uh, committees, reports, recommendations, six one is investment committee. Last meeting was uh, February 23rd after our last board meeting and the next meeting is on April 20th. Uh, oral update from the chair of the investment committee, uh, Trustee Chandra. Uh, you know, we have um, really the investment committee discussed what we ended up discussing today was primarily about strategic asset allocation, so, so no major update. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, item 61B, or minutes from December 20th, um, and um, for Federated Investment Committee, 60 is minutes from December 22nd, Joint Investment Committee. Those are both received in file. 6-2 is the Governance Committee. Uh, last meeting was on March 4, uh, and next meeting is on June 17th. 5A is uh, 6.2A is oral update from the chair of the governance committee, Vice Chair Horowitz. Yes, it was a, a rather full uh, meeting. We discussed at length the updating our policy with respect to uh, replacing both the CEO and the CIO, especially under the circumstances should the offices become suddenly available. We reviewed the policy statements by a number of other uh, peer groups. And we very nearly came to a 
a uh, proposal for a complete uh, uh, policy, there is one outstanding issue and that is uh, who the interim CIO would be in the case of uh, resignation or absence of the CIO. And uh, staff is coming back to us at our next meeting with some suggestions on that particular issue. Uh, we also had on the agenda a discussion on changes to the education plan and again reviewing other peer group policies, uh, but due to the length of the meeting, we deferred that item until our next meeting. Uh, we did, however, have a proposal um, uh, for review here by the full board, uh, the frequency of policy reviews and um, I believe the existing uh, policy was to review all policies on a three-year basis, and we uh, are proposing to extend that to a five-year basis. So I believe that requires uh, approval and adoption by the full board. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the uh, oral update. And just very quickly, 62B is a minutes from December 17th that's receiving files. So 62C is, um, as uh, Vice Chair Horowitz uh, described, a discussion action on the memorandum regarding recommendation to re reduce the required frequency for reviewing the frequent uh, governance um, policies and charters. So that memo is in the packet. And the- um, I should make clear that it's, it's five years or as needed, but a minimum of five years. Yes. Um, from three years or as needed. Thank you. Um, assuming everyone had a chance to look at this, uh, uh, the memo and the recommendation, are there, is there any other, uh, any other questions or any discussion? If not, I'll entertain the motion to approve the um, change in policy to review uh, the governance charges and policies every five years. So moved. Thank you, Vice Chair Horowitz. I will second. All right, thank you, Trustee Chandra. Any other discussion by the board? By the public? Okay, let's do the roll call vote. Vice Chair Horowitz. Aye. Thank you, Trustee Chandra. Trustee Chandra. Sorry about that. I, I, I vote aye. Okay. <laughs> I was having technical Thank difficulties. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Thank you. Trustee Orr. Aye. Thank you. I vote aye on that. So that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, um, Vice Chair Horowitz, for that, uh, for that whole section. 6-3 uh, is the audit committee. Last meeting was on February 18th. And uh, the next meeting is on May 20th, 63A, the oral update from the chair. Trustee Kelleher is not um, on. Uh, Trustee Jennings or Trustee Horowitz, I don't know if any of you uh, wanted to I, I comment. Can, I can jump in. It was a very, very lengthy discussion just as the governance uh, meeting. So it was nice to see very two very, um, um, you know, um, uh, committed meetings uh, for the audit committee and governance and very engaged by trustees. So we have a, quite a few items below. Um, I'm not sure who's driving the screen, but if you can uh, go a little further down from items D below on the audit. Um, so I can see them, but again, um, quite a few discussions. Uh, the audit committee uh, had a chance to meet our new senior, uh, senior auditor who actually is here this, uh, well, I was going to say this morning, but he's, he's joining us at the meeting this afternoon in case uh, your board has any specific questions. Um, there were presentations made uh, uh, at the committee level and discussions on a number of issues. I think the, the, the key one here that we're going to be asking your board to uh, potentially either provide some direction to staff is on item F. Uh, but with that, um, uh, the one area I wanted to comment was uh, on, on item D, the update on the city audit recommendations. I think the, uh, um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure that the, the, uh, the, 
the format that you have uh, here on the audit recommendations um, indicates the uh, the um, um, where we add in terms of the implementation process for the city auditors recommendations uh, by the audit a couple of years ago. And I think uh, the one area I wanted to key in was the first item. I think it's uh, recommendation number five. We have to do, it's funny enough, it has to do with the, uh, the the budget request we just presented to the board this morning. And so I think the version that you have in here indicates that is to be determined when that uh, the recommendation will be fully implemented. And I just recently had a conversation with the auditor for the city and agree with him. He made a presentation to the city council to go with the uh, June 30th date. We have further discussion uh, to to further issues to discuss, uh, but wanted to make you aware of that. The reason uh, your version have uh, to be determined is because the main topic of a difference is that both of you boards, based on uh, fiduciary council legal analysis, um, uh, indicates that uh, investment expenses are not to be part of the administrative budget. Um, and the analysis by the city attorney to the city council uh, not only indicates that the investment expenses are to be part of the administrative budget, but they also indicate that it should include the expenses of the um, money managers. And so, uh, the position that we took uh, uh, from the staff standpoint and the boards is that that's not, again, we don't believe that it's a requirement uh, legally to include, but what we did do was we agreed to do two things. Um, we, as part of this process, as you saw this morning, we do provide um, an expectation of what the potential income may be based on the assumed rate return. And based on that assumed rate return, we also, with the budget process, provide to the city council an estimated amount of investment expenses, assuming that they return the assumed rate return. On top of that, uh, Prabhu and his staff do a great job of providing a very robust uh, expense report that first comes to your board, usually in the month of August, and then it goes to the city council in September about the investment expenses for the prior calendar year. Uh, so we felt that was a very, very reasonable compromise, but nevertheless, uh, because it doesn't really meet the specific recommendation as stated by the city auditor, uh, they're not agreeing that it's a finalized, finalized audit recommendation. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, for me, it was to be determined because I'm, I'm not really seeing a way how we're going to uh, reconcile those two differences, but I did agree with him to have further discussions, so I will keep you posted on that issue. Great. Thank you very much for that uh, update, uh, Mr. Pena. I'll just very quickly note, before we get to the discussion items at 6.3b and C are note receiving file, um, and D. So 6.3e is discussion on the 2020 internal ORS staff survey by um, the senior internal auditor, uh, Mr. Human Bustini, Bustina, excuse me. Yeah, so uh, Human is certainly welcome to speak to it, but I wanted to give you sort of like in a nutshell, E and G were uh, presentations made by Human to the audit committee, which uh, they accepted gladly. They asked on specific questions. There is nothing for you board to actually approve here this morning, but uh, if you do, and I apologize, uh, I check as a general because I jumped from E and G together. But if you do have any specific questions or comments on those two items, I have asked Human to be here this morning, not only so that you get to 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 meet him, but also if there are any specific questions, uh, hopefully he can address them to you directly. So, any questions for um, Mr. Busina? Okay, let's then go to, so thank you very much for that offer. Well, let's go on to item uh, 6.3F, discussion and action on the assessment of the internal audit division by Officer Retirement Services Senior Internal Auditor, Human Busina. Yeah, so uh, again, this was an item where uh, there was a recommendation uh, for action by the senior auditor, uh, some of which included uh, um, 
I don't want to call it conflict of interest, but um, you know, um, I believe that as part of this, his recommendation, he feels that the internal audit division should have the ability to work on their budget. Um, and there are some of the issues as well, right? Uh, there are some limitations on the work that the internal auditor can do because um, they're not really a separate department from the office. Everything they do goes uh, uh, flows through the uh, office retirement services, and then we have to flow that to the boards and the and the um, and the city council. But in a nutshell, um, I believe that there was some discussions at the audit committee level, and again, I welcome Human or, or, or council to speak to this. Uh, but um, I think the direction by the audit committee uh, jointly was to allow council and staff to work um, together and come back with a, a reasonable uh, resolution to, to the request to provide some more flexibility and uh, less conflict uh, for the, uh, uh, as it relates to the, uh, the recommended or requested uh, budget going forward for the tenant audit division or any other kind of work related to the uh, internal audit division that has to be performed by the senior internal auditor. Uh, I don't know who man or, uh, or council, if you have any other comments uh, on that, or you would like to elaborate. Uh, I think you captured it well, Roberta. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Nothing further. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Mr. Pena, on this item, the action is to accept the um, assessment? Is that what, is that the specific action? We I think have? what we are requesting is for your board to uh, um, agree to, to allow council and, and staff to work together to come forward to the audit committee next time with a, a, a solution on the request as, as uh, stated by, by the document provided by the senior internal auditor. So not really a motion per se, but uh, a willingness to provide direction so that again, council and, and staff can work on a resolution of this issue. Okay, yeah, and that seems reasonable. So um, just direction is adequate for today? Sure. All right. Um, that would be fine, Mr. Chairman, to direct it to the governance, uh, to the audit committee for further proceedings. Thank you, council. Yes, so any, um, any other input on that item? my board members okay i think you have it then thank you very much mr pena mr Vecina. um let's go back to the agenda i think we're now on six four the joint personnel committee um, last meeting was november 10 the next meeting is tbd um is there anything uh trust trustee or you'd like to say on this particular item we haven't had the meeting. Uh, Correct. There's really no uh, material updated this time. Once we have the JPC meeting, we'll report back to the full board. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Trustee Orr. Okay. Item seven, education and training. We have the Cortex report and the Calipers virtual trustees roundtable on May 10. Um, any future agenda items? Okay, any Mr. Public? Chair, I just wanted to let you know that we will probably try to bring to your board next month the second phase of the disability training. That's what we're working towards to just in case, uh, just as a heads up. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any um, public retiree comments? All right, well, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time and the great works by staff and consultants uh, for today's meeting. Appreciate it all.